Hey, Georgie. How's it going? It's all right. Rainy weather, a little <laughs> bit of Red Bull, uh, and, yeah. nice, and nice company. What, else, yeah. what, what, what can yeah. I ask for? How are things at Idea Labs? Oh, yeah. Um, they're fine. I, I, I wouldn't say there's been any major changes to, except for the launching of the the steroid and the mineral testing for nails and hair. Uh, that's kind of probably going to be like a separate branch. Uh, I'll try to um, uh, push it through FDA, see what they're going to say, like to actually launch it as a legitimate service. Um, but so far, it's not looking very good. They're basically saying, well, who is the sponsor? Did you do this through university? Because the FDA has like a hotline where you can call and ask questions. And, uh, you know, they were very interested, but also very, not combative, but they're saying, what, you did this by yourself? N no, uh, under no circumstances, you're going to deal with like a garage kind of thing. <laughs> once you have yourself some investors, once basically big money has vetted what you're doing, then we can talk. Until then, they're like, you, you know, they will be able to afford it. We wanna... I don't see a Pfizer stamp next to it. Uh, I don't know if it's good. <laughs> I should have asked the question that I talked to them. Like, have you? Did you come from Pfizer? I mean, like, is this like your part time at Pfizer? Your part time at the FDA? <laughs> uh, anyways, I don't think they actually they actually ban them from working for for Pfizer while they're at the FDA. I think the only requirement is that you have to divest. Uh, you have to put like any any pharma stocks you have. You have to put them like in a trust fund or something like that. But that doesn't prevent the conflict of interest. You're still working regulating an industry in which you are invested directly. Um, so yeah, <laughs> for all well, intents and purposes, FDA is is Pfizer's uh, customer relationship service. Wow. Fun fact, we are about 30 minutes south of a major Pfizer. Is oh, it the, the headquarters? It's the headquarters. The, the, the Probably. Headquarters. We are just south of it. Yeah. It's they moved it. Problem. I think they used to be in New York and because of the, so they're, they're pushing for, you know, all kinds of bad balls in the city, but they themselves are moving out of the city. They're going to like a lower cost, like lower tax uh, uh, area where the properties are cheaper and the property tax is lower. I think Michigan is a very major destination for pharma and for manufacturing in general. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen a big influx in that coming our way. Don't tell any more people. We yeah, don't we, need no, any more. No, no, no. Yeah, I know. I know. Everybody that I know that lives in the sticks is been telling me, please don't come here with full. Okay? Like, <laughs> st stay wherever you are. It's, it's terrible here. Don't you dare come here because it's absolutely terrible. We're good. No more people, please. Stay in your <laughs> cities. Thank you. Well. Yeah, we're uh, <clears throat> hoping to create, like, a little self-sustainable compound here. So we'll be very selective as to who is allowed in. Georgia, you're one of those people. Just just know that. Keep that in mind. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, we're like serious. I'll... We're going to build a little moat, a nice. little wall. Nice. <laughs> I'll find a little spot, like maybe a couple of, I don't know, in distance, a neighbor means somebody who's 20 miles away, right? So right. maybe I can buy something, you know, a couple of miles away and uh, right. you know, start a farm. Because <laughs> we... as, far as, the, as far as the food uh, supply is going, um, I mean, if you go into Whole Foods, it's really sad, basically. It's like it's still supposed to be a high-end store, but now the selection of the food that is there, I think I mentioned it a couple of times on the Daniel Roddy show, Mm, it doesn't feel like a like a, like a high end store. Uh, they they cook food every day. They have this hot bar. They call it really overpriced stuff because <laughs> they sell it by the by by the by the pound. Um, and back in like I would say 2019 up until early 20, 2020 before everything closed down, they would change the food options every day. I mean, maybe that was extreme, okay? But now it's the same thing for months. You know, you know, if they change something, it will be oh, instead of white rice, it will be like brown rice or. <laughs> You know, that's the that's really the change, the only change you'll get it. And then the dairy section used to be basically like three massive refrigerators that occupy these walls, maybe like, I don't know, sixty feet, that that you know, sixty feet of wall all day. And now the refrigerator's still there, but like two thirds of that is like non dairy dairy. Um oh, yeah. cashew, pistachios, I don't know. I don't even know how they make this stuff, but uh yeah, the animal products are, are most certainly being uh, kind of like phased out or at least uh People are being discouraged to buy them. Uh, Whole Foods never used that, never had discounts, but now they have them if you if you buy plant based stuff, not for the meat stuff, not for the animal. Oh gosh, it's a shame. <laughs> we, I mean, all right, so we've got eggs, nice, uh, goat milk, lamb meat, and then we'll have our vegetable, or sorry, like our garden, so we'll be able to grow fruit and stuff like that. And then there are a ton of trees around here for maple syrup tapping. So awesome! I think we can cover all the grounds. Can you, uh, how, how far did you get with the chicken feed? I remember, like, we were talking about uh, creating something that's, like, more focused for chickens. Yeah. So, Georgie, I tried that for a few months, and it is just... Hello? Oh, it uh -oh. froze. Uh-oh. Okay. Sorry about that. 
no um, I, I tried to pursue a chicken feed company for almost most of last year. The same type of situation that's happening with like human food is actually like there are extreme challenges in getting feed ingredients as well. There are huge barriers in buying anything outside of corn and soy. Yeah, of course. It's subsidized. Huge. Yeah. Um, and so we have a, another project that we've been working on where we're collaborating with a feed company. And so we'll be announcing that sometime in the next couple of months to be able to hopefully offer people other stuff. But it is impractical to start a chicken feed company in the current uh, agriculture system because, like you said, of the government subsidies. It just it we would have to price it at like four dollars, like not four dollars a pound, but it would just have to be extremely high priced. Okay. And it's just not practical. Um, what about so, what about a chicken supplement that would like they could add to the feed and kind of like do a lot of these things instead of selling massive pounds of of actual food for the chicken? Yeah, that is true. I still think it would be difficult because I think the ingredient people are looking for is the beef liver, beef liver, beef tallow, and. Ashley was telling me that there's like regulations on adding any sort of animal product back into an animal feed. Mm, I see. So it basically makes the entire idea of that part of the feed kind of not, it's not, not feasible. I think it's something that has to be done on an operation itself. Mm -hmm. The USDA fear mongers animal products in a number mm -hmm. of ways. And in one of those ways, it's around like feed for animals. And so anything that's organic can't cross contaminate animal products with plant products. And so like tallow can't be mixed into you into a hundred percent organic processing feed mill. Like wow. those two things can't mix. And so there was, I learned a lot and you learn why the system is the way that it is right now. It is so like embedded and locked in place. And so just a lot of things just have to be done on your own, which what about something simpler? Like, uh, cause I've been looking, cause eventually I'll probably be forced to start my own chicken thing. Um, yeah. so there's, there are different studies on like adding polycosinol, which is a plant origin dramatically improves like the laying frequency and the, the output of the hands. Um, also a little bit of pregnenolone can also really be very good. Um, what else can you do? You can do like gelatin, but that's animal thing. That's probably going to be a, a problem. Yeah. Because it's a venomology, but it's dirt cheap, right? So at least you can get these things. And uh, there's some very good studies about these things, how they basically keep the chicken healthy, um, increase the food efficiency so that you can get by uh, uh, with less food. Yeah. Um, and also increase the, the output of the chicken, both like meat-wise and also egg-wise. So just what maybe What did you say that three... first supplement was? Oh, so if you just... Uh, polycosinol is like the, polycosinol. these are very long-chain alcohols that are in, in our product, talk of it. It's basically like saturated fats, but they're very, very long chain, and they're present in wheat germ oil. Uh, in in most grains, the hull basically that, that's around it, the grain that's a very rich source of these. They're kind of like waxes. You can get okay. them from from propolis. So maybe that's another thing you can do, like add a little <laughs> bit of make a solution of propolis, polycosinol, and maybe a little bit of pregnenolone in olive oil. So all of this is plant, except maybe for the propolis, and maybe you can drop that if FDA is really annoying. And then these just these these three or four things can actually be. You know, just a few drops weekly, not even daily. Um, and you sell this as a, you know, as a chicken feed supplement. I don't know yeah, how it can be marketed. Idea. Yeah. And it's yeah. it's a tiny bottle, like a, an ounce bottle, even smaller. And yeah. it's going to last them a long time. It'll be much higher markup. Um, and uh, unless you have the USDA. Drop it in. Yeah. 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 They can even drop it in if they grab yeah. the chicken. The chicken likes that. Yeah, um, we yeah. need an assembly line for like 800 chickens. <laughs> this is a good. This is a good idea. I like this because honestly, like, with how like contaminated the environment is, our air, our water, like now the soil is going to be infiltrated with all these toxic chemicals from all the spills. Like, chickens need health support too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, yep. And so, like, animals are being impacted, and we still want to raise animals outdoors. And yep. so, how can we support them too? Just you can mix also like the several studies about the fat soluble vitamins. Mm. They, they can dissolve very well in like olive oil as well, right? So yeah. you can do that. You, you dissolve in vitamin E, then you add the polycosinol and the pregnenolone. Um, and I mean, I've been thinking about this. Well. I actually tested it back in Bulgaria, um, and people there are now using it. Um, but I just haven't, you know, because it's not my niche. I, I haven't produced it on a mass scale and sold it. But yeah. I don't see a reason why you guys shouldn't be running it with it here because it's a single product, all plant-based, um, unless USDA or FDA have, have something to say about it. 
Um, you know, it's like, oh, you can't do like, I don't know. Maybe they say that you cannot give pregnant alone because it's a steroid. But I don't think that's the case. Because I've looked, the stuff that I've seen so far, the only thing they can come back with is they may ask you to do some kind of a, a toxicity testing. Like, yeah. on, I don't know, pay somebody with 100 chickens to see if, if it's going to kill them. Or like, if it changes their organs or something like that. Yeah. Um, other than that, I, I don't think there are more restrictions than selling this for humans either. Yeah. This is a fun experiment. I think I think we're going to try this, especially coming out of this winter to like help boost them a little bit. They've been cooped up. Um, granted, they're still running all around the farm, but <laughs> coming out of these cold temperatures, I think it would be metabolically supportive for the yep. chickens. Pro-metabolic okay. chicken supplement. Mm-hmm. <laughs> pro, I don't know, pro output. I mean, I know a lot of farmers are doing the chickens for the eggs yeah. and the meat. That, that there are studies for that as well. You can actually yeah. be very well referenced instead of True. trying to convince somebody out of the blue that hey, put these magic drops into the chicken and then see what happens. <laughs> I, I like this. I like this. In, uh, extending the work of Doctor Ray Pete to our chickens' health as well. I uh, I asked him uh, maybe two years ago when one of the Danish shows. I said, uh, "What do you think about this giving to the chickens?" He said, "I'm surprised nobody has done it yet." Uh, because you know, he he said he when people call him about pets and stuff like cats and dogs, he'd been telling them give it pregnenolone, give it policosinol, give it some vitamin D or E. And I'm saying, well, yeah, but you know, okay, this one pet, it's in the family. But what about people that are raising animals and now we have all these swine flus? What are they imagine or not? A separate story. We have this like you know diseases among goats and other cooped animals. And he's saying, I don't know why they're not doing it. I've been telling people to do it, but you know they just don't believe me. Yeah. Well, speaking of Dr. Ray Pete, we would love to dive into a topic that I think that Dr. Ray Pete really was one of the leaders in discussing and bringing to people's attention because mainstream kind of says the exact opposite. Um, Do you want to kind of introduce the topic for today? Yeah. So we definitely wanted to dive into this whole connection between hypothyroidism, serotonin, estrogen, endotoxin, and histamine, because I feel like in the health world, a lot of these topics are taken separate and broken yeah. down as opposed to kind of looking at this entire cycle of how they are all connected. And I know that in the mainstream, I think serotonin is often boosted as just the happy hormone. Histamine is looked at as a completely different allergenic component mm-hmm. to your diet and maybe just like histamine intolerance is thrown around a lot instead of looking at the metabolic function of the human and how these elements might be connected. So we kind of, I know that's a very broad yeah. overview of a, a very large topic, um, but I think maybe starting with breaking down serotonin a little bit so we can sure. better understand that before we dive into how it's connected to hypothyroidism. I think the probably the main reason these the serotonin and the, and the histamine are not viewed as as negative as they should is the fact that they're viewed in isolation, right? If you if you talk to a doctor and talk to a doctor about the endotoxin, without a doubt, they're all going to tell you that's not a good thing. We we use endotoxin in animal research to trigger anaphylactic reactions, fibrosis, cancer, heart disease, all of these things. They know about endotoxin. But, the, you know, for some reason, this connection, I'm starting to suspect it's on purpose, has never been made in the literature that you cannot have endotoxin without having serotonin as well. And the main reason is that 90% of the serotonin, or even more, is produced in the gastrointestinal tract, right? And that's where, that's where endotoxin really originates from. So when you're eating these foods that are not properly digested and get to the colon, um, you know, to the microbiome in a semi-undigested form, the bacteria there starts to eat them. And whenever you have a bacterial colony given food, the turnover of the bacterial colony increases, which means all the bacteria will die. And then as they rupture, uh, the gram-negative type of the bacteria has this component in their outer layer called endotoxin, also known as lipopolysaccharide. It's just a molecule that mixes like a, you know, a fat with a sugar molecule. Uh, and it's really bad because it's basically amphiphilic. It has a hydrophobic chain and a hydrophilic chain, and it can basically get, get into the body, into the cells quite easily. Um, so what happens is when you re- when you feed this bacteria, let's say with resistant starch, which is not a recommendation you've been getting for a very long time to this day, it continues actually. When you give bacteria resistant starch, it's actually one of the worst things you can do for your health because it increases the, the turnover rate of the colony there, and then the, this increases the amount of endotoxin. Now, while the endotoxin is still in the column, it's not; it hasn't entered the bloodstream, uh, that's that's more or less okay. It's still dangerous, and now there are studies showing that if you have a chronic elevated endotoxemia inside of the column, 
It's a risk factor for colon cancer. It's a, it's actually a causative factor for inflammatory bowel disease, such as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, right? Uh, but you know, over time, what happens is that this constant uh, because the endotox is a very inflammatory molecule. By uh, by uh, uh, you know uh, getting into contact with the with the with the wall of the intestine with the epithelial cells there, over time, basically, it it kind of inflames those cells, and and the so-called gut barrier is compromised. In other words, your gut is supposed to selectively, uh, your, your, your entire intestine is supposed to selectively enter, uh, allow certain substances in and keep others out. Endotoxin is something that's, that the organism knows to keep out. So in a normal healthy function organism in an intestine, uh, endotoxin will stay mostly into the colon and then get excreted. Uh, however, you know, with, if it's being constantly overproduced, over time it will compromise the barrier and then parts of this endotoxin will start entering the bloodstream. Uh, and that's the part where even mainstream medicine will say we don't we don't want that. That's a bad situation, because once endotoxin gets into the bloodstream, the body treats it as a low grade bacterial infection. In fact, the uh, endotoxin activates the family of so called toll like receptors (TLR) one I think one through nine. There are like nine different types of them, but the four TLR four being the most uh, kind of like uh, selective for the endotoxin, and that that receptor is what the body uses to recognize. When there is an invasion of bacteria, bacteria outside pathogenic bacteria that we can get infected with also activate that receptor. So when this a a receptor is activated, then the body starts producing things like nitric oxide, serotonin, histamine to kind of like amp up your immune system and get you ready to fight an infection, which there isn't um, in, in the case of just getting this endotoxin. So by chronically eating, repeatedly eating these foods that are feeding your bacteria, you're getting in the situation of basically chronic food allergies. Some people are saying like, what's going on? I didn't used to have an allergy to this food and I'm getting the allergy to this food. Well, chances are that over time you've compromised the gut barrier and now you basically, anything can make you feel allergic, right? Um, and I know people who basically have to, have started having these reactions and when they take an antihistamine or they take charcoal, which is how it shows that it's really the endotoxin driving this, these reactions disappear. Um, so, um, so basically, any time endotoxin gets into the bloodstream or even just stays in the column but, but touches the wall, the intestinal wall, uh, the, the enterochromaffin cells lighting the intestinal wall start to produce serotonin. That, that's the, our major source of serotonin. 90% of the circulating serotonin is produced there. Uh, the other 10% are being produced locally into the brain. Um, and then uh, basically, uh, once this reaction starts, then you have basically a lot of histamine, serotonin, and toxin floating around your system, nitric oxide as well. Uh, the primary role of nitric oxide in the body is actually attacking foreign pathogens. The secondary role is an emergency vasodilator, but the primary role is actually as a cute attack tool for, for, for foreign invaders. Um, and uh, that part, medicine doesn't like to discuss very much because it sells drugs that are increasing nitric oxide as a vasodilator, which it does have this function, but also pathologically. In other words, if you're not producing enough carbon dioxide, which is the primary vasodilator, then the body will produce nitric oxide as needed. Unfortunately, nitric oxide is a free radical. It's also very, very pro-inflammatory itself. It can stimulate the synthesis of the prostaglandins and the leukotrienes from the PUFAs. So by having chronic elevated nitric oxide, that's not a good situation. Uh, when you have a foreign invader, like a virus or a bacteria, sure, the body increases temporarily the nitric oxide supply. But imagine having this 24-7 or at least three times a day, every time you eat something, right? Initially, you're resistant to the, to the allergic reactions because you, your gut is in good shape. And by the way, the gut barrier, uh, it's, it's basically how well it gets recovered depends on the metabolic rate. Uh, the turnover of these cells depends entirely on the metabolic rate. So if some cells are damaged and are starting to leak and uh, you know allow the toxin into the bloodstream, well, you're not going to have these repaired as easily and as, as quickly if your metabolic rate is low. Unfortunately, the inflammatory reaction triggered by this, this chronic assault on the intestine actually lowers the metabolic rate. So it's really like a vicious circle, basically. You cannot recover until you recover. So the question is, so what do we do? Well, I think the first thing is to be stop this assault, chronic assault on the intestine as much as possible. Eat the easily digestible foods, right? Um, and then, you know, uh, try to uh, try to uh, uh, keep the intestine as clean as possible. Uh, insoluble fiber is one good way. Charcoal is another good way. Some people take antibiotics. That's another option. But I'm not that keen on the antibiotics because it tends to change the composition of, the, of your microbiome. And in some people, it can basically allow for opportunistic bacteria that is not very susceptible to this antibiotic to take over because the other bacteria are getting killed 
and now you may end up in a in a you know in a worse situation. Very rare, but but it's been known to happen. There even published case studies. So so we, now we know that endotoxin, histamine, and serotonin and nitric oxide always go together. Endotoxin is universally recognized as bad, but if endotoxin, and serotonin, and histamine always go together, how can histamine and serotonin be good? Histamine is now recognized as a basic as an inflammatory mediator. Used to be, uh, you know, uh, medicine would say, well, its primary its primary two functions are basically keeping you awake. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, signaling the immune system that they're foreign invaders so it can get attacked. Um, you know, the maybe like the, I, I don't think histamine is the primary thing that keeps you awake, but it does have some of that role. Uh, but the, the question is, what happens if you get it chronically increased, right? Um, and then um, by mistake, medicine started to see that people who are taking antihistamines long term, they have a much lower uh, uh, incidence or, or risk of virtually all of the chronic disease that we're seeing these days. Uh, it, it shouldn't be because they're saying histamine has nothing to do with diabetes. Histamine has nothing to do with heart disease. Histamine has nothing to do with uh, uh, with uh, cancer or with Alzheimer's disease. Apparently it does. Uh, and even it's not histamine the record that's doing it. Um, basically, the, it's it's part of the so-called like shock field that I call a disease field. And once one of these mediators is triggered, no matter how, then basically the others get elevated as well because they're part of the same sort of like primordial defense mechanism that the body triggers to deal with, with a foreign threat or could be internal, but it became internal because you got it from the outside. Uh, endocrine disruptors can also trigger a similar reaction. Uh, and the, the interesting thing is that virtually all the substances that are that are known to be bad for us, they're triggering histamine and serotonin and nitric oxide release, right? So so uh, then medicine started looking at what happens when you actually nitric oxide gets chronically increased. As I said, it's an emergency vasodilator. It attacks the pathogens, right? Those are good things. Um, but then what happens if it's chronically elevated? They have a drug on the market that's been used since, I think, the 1940s. It's called nitroglycerin, also a component of dynamite. Uh, and basically, yeah, it's the same molecule. So, so whenever people with heart disease, advanced heart disease, they have like a lot of angina, which is chest pain, um, and they're commonly being put on a nitroglycerin or some other kind of nitric oxide NO releasing agent. And then medicine started to know to notice that these people are basically expired much quicker than all the others who weren't getting this drug. Uh, and they tried all kinds of tricks to convince us this is a statistical anomaly, as just as the obesity paradox. It's not there. We're seeing bad things, but it refused to disappear. And so now they're basically saying that if you have a heart disease, if you have heart disease, um, and if you're if your angina is well controlled or it's not, not causing you that much of a problem, talk to your doc doctor about not putting you on nitroglycerin or maybe choosing some kind of other agent that does not result in nitric oxide release. Um, so what about serotonin? Uh, well, serotonin. Um, back in the 50s and 60s actually was called called enteramin which to signify the fact that it's uh, that is basically produced mostly into your gut the enteric system right the enteric nervous system um, and medicine back in the day knew serotonin once it's in the blood and it's elevated it's a really nasty molecule it's the primary driver of fibrosis it can actually trigger the formation of tumors de novo without any tumors being present uh, there before. It can actually trigger the reactivation of dormant tumors, cancers that are in remission for whatever reason, either by treatment or spontaneously. Um, and basically, it's a master controller of the metabolic rate. Serotonin suppresses the metabolic rate, primarily in the brain. So speaking of the brain, serotonin is now known as the happiness hormone. You know, you know, every, every person who is on depression, who has depression or any kind of other psychiatric illness, I think invariably they'll get put on SRI, just in case, because you know, they, they, they'll dole it out like candy. It's it's safe, no problem. We're giving it to pregnant women. <laughs> yeah, and now we have autism going on, right? Uh, oh, we're giving it to children. And now we have children with heart valve disease, which medicine up until recently, up until a couple of days ago, claimed had nothing to do with, with serotonin. And a study just came out that actually it's serotonin driving the so-called mitral valve disease, which which is now very widespread in the population. Uh, they keep claiming that it's benign, it's nothing to worry about. They rarely progress into heart failure. Turns out all these claims are untrue. Uh, it's not benign. It almost invariably progresses into heart failure, which is medicine claims that incurable. The only option is heart transplant, right? Um, and more interestingly, while medicine is claiming that serotonin is great for you, Behind the scenes, many companies, our favorite Pfizer, one of them, is running clinical trials with serotonin antagonists, serot drug drugs that block serotonin or its effects, to actually treat all of these conditions that they told us have nothing to do with serotonin. Uh. Heart failure, pulmonary fibrosis, pu uh, idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, liver failure, liver cirrhosis, right? Uh, all of these things now turn out to be 
driven by serotonin. Uh, and these clinical trials, uh, I've been I've been following them for ever since they started. They're actually into their final phase, which means the drug is working. It's one drug, but its only known effect is actually antagonism of one or more of the so-called serotonin receptors. Um, so, uh, and even back in the day, in the 1950s, the doc- doctors knew that virtually every person with cancer, uh, every once in a while, would basically start to flush for no reason, get this like basically like uh, you know cold sweats, flush. Sometimes they'll get fever, and then they managed to tie this to the elevation of serotonin. And the ser- because serotonin triggers the activity of the enzyme histidine decarboxylase, serotonin increases the synthesis of histamine. It also prevents, to a large degree, its breakdown because they compete for some of the same breakdown enzymes. So, so if ser- histamine is now universally known, or at least accepted by medicine, to actually be a bad, you know, a, a, a ba- um, not a bad, but uh, certainly not a benign component um, of our immune system, and we don't want its levels to be chronically high, then something that triggers very reliably the increase in histamine cannot possibly be good. Everywhere you look at serotonin, whether metabolically or the, its specific enzyme activities, you're going to see that it basically is a metabolic inhibitor, promotes inflammation, it's the direct driver of fibrosis, um, and basically, if anything, it's actually it should be a cause of depression if one were logical and look at all these effects instead of the cure. And after maybe like what forty years now, medicine claiming that serotonin is the cure for depression. You know, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, etc. A study came out in 2016 by a very famous psychiatrist. I think he's the chair of the APA, the American Psychiatric Association. And the study is titled, you can look it up, serotonin dash upper or downer. And then in that study, that person says, um, I spent my career being told and telling patients that serotonin is the greatest thing since sliced bread. But one day, because I saw all these people not improving on serotonin drugs, I just sat down and reviewed the literature. And I said, wow. That's great. 40 years of career, and finally you sit down and read the manual, right? <laughs> Instead of being that being at the start. And he says, and I was, I was petrified. Every study that I checked demonstrated that in depression, serotonin levels are higher, not lower. And he's saying, well, some people argue this is adaptive, right? The body says, oh, you're depressed. I'm going to raise your serotonin levels, right, to protect you from depression. He's saying that's not actually what the, what the intervention uh, animal studies demonstrated. In fact, every single serotonin antagonist known whether in research circles or in the market, has demonstrated robust antidepressant effects in animal studies, and and has never been has never d- demonstrated depressive effects. So you really can't have it. There's the unescapable conclusion is that serotonin is a causative factor, if not the factor, for causing depression. Maybe it's some other factors too. We know inflammation is involved, but serotonin serotonin stimulates it. We know histamine is involved in depression, but serotonin seems to stimulate it. Wait, wait, wait. So, Georgie, like, how did we even get to the place of it being accepted that serotonin oh, is the happy hormone? Like, how very, did that very interesting originate? story. Yeah, I think freedom-loving Americans will appreciate it. Not just Americans, but freedom-loving people. Back in the 60s, when the hippie movement was experimenting with LSD, uh, the government was gearing up to fight the war in Vietnam. So, of course, they need compliant population. They need, you know, uh, vicious psychopathic soldiers that follow orders. They're basically don't question authority. And then they noticed that when they started recruiting and drafting these people from the hippie movement and sending them to Vietnam, the ones who were doing acid, as also LSD is called on the street, uh, they were a nightmare for the commanders. They would not follow <laughs> orders. They would basically uh, uh, flee. <laughs> they would desert. Uh, they they actually had a much higher rate of fragging of fratricide. They would kill the, the commanders because the commanders will tell them to kill civilian Vietnamese people. Um, so so the military said, no, we can't. What's going on? Why are these people acting like this? So then they they did their own experiments, and there's there, there are these famous videos. If you type on Google uh, "soldiers marching LSD" and look at YouTube, there are these YouTube videos from the 60s and 70s. We have the military did experiments with the soldiers, and they have two groups of soldiers. One not taking LSD, basically, and then marching in perfect formation. I mean, it's like clockwork, like a single person. 20 people or 50 people marching as one. That's what the military wants. And then and then a platoon that's taking LSD comes in, and it's a it's nightmare. They're rolling on the ground, giggling. They're poking each other. They're telling jokes. They completely ignore the commander as if he's not, he's not even there, right? And the military said, oh, my God, can you imagine what will happen if this LSD becomes widely used on a societal scale? We're going to have a complete breakdown. Nobody will follow any orders again. So they started pushing the idea that LSD makes people insane by making them manic or whatnot. And they're saying, well, what can we do to basically have the reverse effect? Because we definitely love it. Uh, And then we're going to worry how to market afterwards. So they said, you know, 
it was it was known from animal research at the time that LSD is a approximate serotonin antagonist and also activates the dopamine system. So they said, well, let's come up with a drug that does the exact opposite. And that's how the, the SSRIs were born. And basically, from the beginning, even during the clinical trials, many of the doctors that were on the teams that were reviewing the different clinical sites were saying, no, nah, I don't think SSRI is good for depression. People are actually committing suicide when we give them SSRI. And FDA said, "Oh, no problem. We're going to put it as a warning on the on, as a black box warning on the on the on the drug." But we're going to keep selling it. So you're depressed, and your primary risk for depressed people, the the things that worry doctors, is you're going to kill yourself. Yet they give you a drug that is actually proven to increase their, their risk of suicide. I don't know how to call this. It's either they're either too dumb or or, or ridiculously evil. And it was so bad that Germany. When Prozac was first released, Germany refused to approve it into their health system, said under no circumstances will allow this drug to be in. Not only we disagree with the findings of the trials, which they suspected were manipulated, or at least the inconvenient data was removed. They're saying we did our own trials and basically it, it started, people started killing themselves. So we're not going to allow it. But, you know, uh, Uncle Sam and in general, the farm industry flexes a lot of muscle and they convinced Germany. But even then, Germany was the first a country in the world to put a black box warning on Prozac and subsequently on all of the SSRIs, no uh, uh, warning people that they actually increase the risk of suicide. Um, and then as a, in, in combination of that, the, because the German government said, okay, we're getting our arm twisted. There's nothing we can do. Uh, we've been told to approve Prozac. We're going to release something called, they had a um, government commission called Commission E. And that commission said, we're going to collect all of the all of the evidence for herbs and like natural treatments that the German nation has and has collected over the centuries. We're going to catalog all of this into one big book and we're going to release it and we're going to tell people officially. Uh, and to this day, this is true. In Germany, you can actually request herbal treatment for your problem if there is a herbal treatment listed in that book that is known to work for this disease. That would be a nightmare. I don't think it will, any, it will happen in any other country. And I'm, I suspect it, even in Germany now, this is very heavily discouraged. You, by law, you can request it. But it doesn't mean you're going to get it easy. Your doctor can yell at you or refuse to treat you or send you to a, a you know another doctor or say that like, I'm not going to work with you. So just at least it's available and it demonstrates that Germany was very much against the SSRIs from the start. Yeah. And now and now we see multiple studies coming out saying that if you give SSRIs to pregnant women, the risk of autism basically quadruples. It's already high. It's already I think like uh, two or three on a hundred. So three percent of the of the population of the newly born population will be born autistic worse if you give the child ssris which they are approved for now a psychiatrist can diagnose a child as young as a two-year-old with depression how did you do that it cannot speak yet and all psychiatry does it has a checklist called dsm the diagnostic statistical manual of psychiatric disease that's their bible they don't have not many people know but psychiatry is a very voodoo profession very voodoo branch of medicine they don't have an objective biomarker for depression. They don't have a blood test for depression. They don't have a physiological test for depression. All they have is this checklist, which they call it the Beck scale of depression. And they go, then they go through a checklist. And if you answer specifically, they're going to de- diagnose you as, the, how did you diagnose a two-year-old? It has no idea of what, like, uh, when you're watching TV, you know, like over the last four nights, did you contemplate the idea of suicide? That's one of the questions, Right. Uh, so I don't know how it worked, but basically now we're having a, a really a, an outbreak of autism. Um, it's never been this way. Medicine tried to blame it on genetics. Uh, multiple studies demonstrated it's not genetic. And now they're saying, yes, it is something in the environment. We just don't know what it is. And and wow. that's how we... Yeah. So you, you're saying that like Germany um, has these labels of like this drug increases the risk of depression. Um, you know... Of suicide. Up, of suicide. Of suicide. Sorry. Of yeah. suicide. Growing up, we like when watching TV, you'd see all these drug commercials come on, and then at the end, you know, it has the really fast pace mm-hmm. uh, talking, <laughs> and it scrolls quickly of all the warnings. And I wonder yeah. if Prozac has on there this drug increases the risk of suicide. That's crazy. I also know in Germany that they are more accepting of like frequency treatment in medicine and utilizing things like rife and stuff which is just not really utilized here as well utilize uh, what what what, what like you using frequencies of different organisms to try to heal or oh oh electromagnetic treatment yeah, she said, oh, as yeah. I said, yeah. Rife. in yeah. germany like i've heard a lot of different stories about treating cancer and stuff utilizing other therapies and herbs and natural ways in these other countries that is completely unacceptable here in the U.S. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. but yeah. A lot of the research actually came out of the U.S. I mean, if you look at the early 20th century, the U.S. was created most of the science behind these treatments for yeah. therapy. 
photodynamic therapy, the treatment of, uh, with quinones, which Dr. Koch, the FDA, literally exiled and said, don't you ever come back here because we're going to put you in jail for life. So back in the early, very early 20th century, he was treating cancer with quinones. And then when, when he got exiled, he went to Brazil and he continued his studies with uh, the bark of the tree called Pau Darco. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah. Uh, people make tea from it, but it's basically, it contains a number of different powerful naphtoquinones, which are very similar structure to vitamin K. Um, and, and that was back in 1905, 1906 timeframe. So a lot of that stuff, and also um, basically they noticed that, uh, that people with, uh, uh, with cancer, their cells are, are depolarized which is due to the low metabolic rate mm -hmm. uh, because the electrons are not capable of accumulating and creating this discharge, this difference in potential. So they said, well, can we actually restore the potential of a cell by using frequencies? Multiple studies on, the, on this have been done, multiple publications, but medicine, basically the national, after the National Cancer Institute was created, they said all these studies are old. They never had a control group. So we cannot really discuss them because according to our modern terminology and requirements, these studies are not legit. Okay, you can't. I mean, I was saying, like, well, listen, <laughs> even if it's placebo effect, these yeah. people are claiming that 19 out of 20 people with lethal cancer they get blasted with this EMF device, they live. Uh, shouldn't we try it? I mean, <laughs> yeah. what is it gonna do? Kill them? These people are terminal already. This is insane. But that those are the rules, as you it's not profitable. No, I yeah, think that's course, super disappointing. Yeah. So, you said that Pfizer is coming out with serotonin antagonists, or they're in the research stages of this. What do you think they're gonna do with their SSRIs? Keep selling them. Keep so we sell them. both? Because the SSRI oh, exactly. will create Ex a bigger exactly. problem, and then they can solve <laughs> exactly. that problem. Exactly. Yeah, drugs, more did, money. Did you, yeah. did you look at the video that just came out? Did you see it with the Pfizer director that was undercover, that the Project Veritas, where they basically like the... The Project Veritas guy uh, goes on, on these dates using a uh, grinder, so it's gay people. Um, and he's, go he's basically uh, tricking people to come on a date with him, and then he starts asking them a question. So, so it doesn't trick everybody, just specific people. So the latest thing, there is all, several blockbuster things with like uh, uh, NIH staff, like the uh, CDC staff saying masks are completely uh, ineffective, the vaccines are bad, etc. And now this guy, who is a Pfizer director, I think he still is. I don't know how. Uh, and I don't know if he's going to continue to be alive for too long, given what he said. So on secret camera, this guy said, don't tell this to anybody. But Pfizer is mutating the COVID virus, the SARS-CoV, in the lab so we can preemptively come up with a vaccine before this mutation even hits the streets. And the journalist said, so hold on a second. Uh, I mean, like, are you telling me that you're basically creating the disease and then you already have the remedy? He's like, well, you have to be very careful because, like, um, I don't want to say that we're releasing the virus into the wild. I'm just saying that we're pre pre preemptively trying to create the vaccines for the specific mutations that we that we created in the lab. And then the guy says, well, how does it always happen that the mutations that are out there in the wild, you ought to have a vaccine for, for them? Mutation, you're either extremely lucky into selecting uh, the mutations that the wild virus will do. That's, that, that's not possible because there are trillions of possibilities there. And you're always a step ahead of the virus. How is it possible? And the guy kind of said... Uh, I can't really tell you, but I think you get the idea. I think that um, this like goes back to humans thinking that we can outsmart nature with mm -hmm. technology, with pills, and like biology is so much more complex than like any of us will understand. And we're trying to isolate it into these silos. And uh, pharma has realized how profitable it is to keep everything separated as like address your cholesterol, address your blood pressure, yep. here's serotonin. All right, histamine is completely unseparate, like is separate from that. When in reality, like you've demonstrated in the beginning, these things operate together. Like the body yep. is a system. It's not yep. these individual parts. Yep. Um, can we, let's just, you presented a lot of information in the beginning. I think we should break it down a little bit um, and talk about like, okay, how is this gut situation initiated? So well, I think yeah. is it's... it like the chicken or the egg? Is it more from a slow metabolic rate increasing the production of endotoxin because we have a slower transit time? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, well, it's all cycles. Every single right. thing is a cycle, right? So yeah. for some people, it maybe started they inherited like a compromised gut system due to the SSRIs. They're known to compromise the gut. Oh, speaking of the serotonin in the gut. Uh, medicine used to say it's completely benign to the gut. It's produced there. There is no logic. There's no logical reason why serotonin will be harming the gut, given that it's produced there. Recent study came out, uh, also on my blog, showed that inflammatory bowel disease 
can be triggered. So serotonin is a necessary and sufficient condition. If nothing else is there, nothing else changes, not even endotoxin, just by increasing serotonin into the gut, you can give yourself inflammatory bowel disease, mm. which medicine claims is incurable. Uh, serotonin increases the gut permeability. So how does it all start? Well, it's hard to say because, you know, let's say a person is born and, you know, if they're born with already with digestive problems, I would suspect that the mother was probably stressed during pregnancy, was given SSRIs yeah, or other that, toxins. There's the study that shows that the mothers who ate more PUFA have babies with higher allergies. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because the, the PUFAs themselves are promoters of endotoxin synthesis and release of serotonin, mm -hmm. of estrogen, of histamine. So the, all these things go together. And really the question is, how did we end up with eating things that are bad for us? Because that's really like a big factor in this. Uh, uh, and because most of the stuff that's basically happening to us, it's not genetic, okay? The medicine has tried for now probably close to 100 years to discover a gene for any of these diseases that we, that we know because it will be very profitable for them to come up with a drug that either activates or, or suppresses that gene to cure the disease. Well, Georgie, it's also, it's also very profitable to push the message of, oh, that's just genetic. Here's yeah. a pill because you can't yeah. fix it. It's just genetic. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. yeah. And now, and, and they, they're using actually this for the genetic because now they're saying, well, when it, since it's genetic and we're not yet allowed to use the gene editing on humans, but don't worry, that's coming. Uh, the only thing we can do for you is to give you a drug that manages the symptoms, right? So that's really, that's the thing. But they kind of tell him implicitly, don't bother doing anything else because it's you're really screwed, okay? There's nothing else that can work for you until we're allowed to hack you, literally, and change your genes. Until then, we're going to give you the very powerful drug that manages your symptoms because of your bad genes. Uh, but that's really a fraudulent story. There's no G, even the BRCA gene that is very, very popular for among women who are worried about breast cancer. It was demonstrated basically by if you remove their breasts, right? Uh, first of all, it doesn't guarantee they're not going to develop cancer somewhere else. Uh, and second, they've already had clinical trials um, that they give they give animals drugs that suppress the BRCA genes. Uh, and these animals are just susceptible to cancer as the ones without the BRCA gene. Uh, so this whole thing turned out to be just a very profitable fraud. Uh, there's a company that owns the patent to these BRCA genes. They, I think they own the patents to the test, to the blood test or like the uh, biopsy test for these genes. It's really amazing. And then the, really the treatment, as they're saying, is that, well, double mastectomy for you if, you if you test positive. But then these women that went through it, Angela and Jolie, Christina Applegate, uh, now they're basically finding out that the risk of cancer is not actually, not only not decreased, they can still develop it there in the absence of a mammary gland. So it's not the gene, something else is going on and the messing with the gene is not going to do any good. In fact, it can actually create a, a different problem. I think in one study, animal study, when they blocked the BRCA genes, the animals started developing much higher rates of ovarian cancer. Well, <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, okay, I'm gonna cut off my breasts in the hope that I'm not gonna have breast cancer, but now I have a much higher chance of ovarian cancer, which by the way is, is deadlier. Um, so really terrible situation. But anyways, where does it start? Well. You, it always starts from the environment. Uh, and whether by environment you mean your mom was given something while you, while she was pregnant with you, or you were given something while you were a child, or you were stressed as a child. Uh, p children that grow in abusive uh, uh, families, uh, foster homes and whatnot, and just in general abusive parents, they're now known to basically be at a, at a much higher risk of all the chronic diseases, including, including the allergy diseases as well. And they always, they, almost all of them have digestive problems. So really, like every time you're stressed and the blood gets withdrawn from the GI tract, gets sent to the brain and the heart to keep you alive, because those are really the crucial organs, then basically that allows endotoxin that is already in the colon to absorb into the, into the bloodstream. The lack of blood in this area is what allows the intestine to increase its permeability and absorb a lot of things that it's not supposed to. So even something as simple as chronic anxiety can actually give you digestive problems in the long run because you're chronically over-absorbing endotoxin from the bloodstream. So, I know people who had problems uh, because of chronic anxiety. They got a, a diagnosis with generalized anxiety disorder, the GAD. It's an official diagnosis. And when they were given an anti-anxiety drug, uh, basically the anxiety was still there, but their digestive problems disappeared or like were ameliorated. So it shows you that something is benign is because the doctor, will, you know, doc, if you tell the doctor, look, I'm really anxious about the whole situation in the world. The doctor was like, hmm. I'm going to send you to a psychiatrist, <laughs> I'm going to pump you full of drugs. But if you, tell, if you tell the doctor, listen, my anxiety is messing with my digestion, I think the doctor will laugh you out of the room. They will say that there's, there's no correlation. Well, That's interesting. so I know you don't believe that like genetics play a role, but I think that we're at, since it's 2023 now, 
we've now had a few generations of this. Mm-hmm. And so epigenetics could be playing a role because yes. maybe your great grandma had a compromised gut. She had your mom, your mom had a compromised gut and yep. you're being born in a compromised gut. That is not Absolutely. two generations that way. Yep. I should maybe clarify that when I said I don't think it's genetic, that doesn't mean it's not heritable, okay? And that's a big... Th- Most people, when they hear when they hear the statement, they say, that's impossible, you're talking nonsense. No, lately, it's now the epigenetics is huge, but also the fact that we can inherit things non- non-genomically. Uh, there was a very big... Uh, not big, but like very famous and controversial uh, presentation in one of the conferences, maybe five or six years ago, where scientists was presenting a study with uh, rats and their pups. And basically, so the rats that basically uh, some some rats were exposed to cat urine, and because the mother knows that the rat is a predator, right? Uh, basically, the pups, even though they were already formed, right? Then the pups, when they were born, they were afraid of cat urine. They've never seen a cat before in their life, but they know it's a predator. They get terrified and they run back into the den. While the like the the like the uh, mother that basically was already pregnant and got exposed to like nice soothing music, I think they were massaging it. I think they were gave her some drugs that actually blocked the olfactory receptor that recognizes cat urine. The pups that were born to this mom, they basically were fearless and would actually approach the cat. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but I'm saying it just in- illustrates that that you inherit a lot of things from your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents. The question is for how long? Well, actually, the line is indefinite. Back to the beginning of time or the, the human race, or even before that, because we all supposedly come from a single organism. But studies with worms demonstrated that you are metabolically and epigenetically, and what you are right now, you're the weighted average of the last 14 generations. Wow. So basically, 99% of you is basically your mom, your parents come for about 50%, your grandparents come for about 20%, your great-grandparents come for about 8%, and in increasing, decreasing, increasingly smaller percentages down to the 14 generations, that's you now. You're basically the living memory of your of your uh, forefathers and foremothers, the last 14. Actually, a lot more than 14, but the last 14 comprise about 99% of you. You imagine the health of 14 generations from now? I know. I'm like, the, they're basing it off me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh. And the good news in the worm is that basically they demonstrated that when you give them these, I think, nanoparticles or some other toxins... The effects were manifesting for 14 generations later. The good news is that if the worm with a really compromised health was given a very nice environment, plenty of food, lack of predators, uh, and basically generally stimulating nice environment that we would find probably pleasant as well, those damages were reversed in a single generation. So yeah. first, so two, two measures here. Be very careful what you do because you're affecting 14 generations to the future, at least. But and also don't get don't get desperate if you have poor health because with the right attitude and with the right interventions you can probably negate virtually all of the stuff that you inherited all the baggage yeah. that came into this world that you have no control. Back to the People say I have no control of it. You do have control over it. Oh, definitely. I think there's there's a lot of people too who are looking into like generational trauma and mm-hmm. understanding you know why they may react to certain things and how it's affecting their health. And so I do think there's some merit there too, based on what you were saying and with the the cat and the mouse study yeah, uh, yeah, already knowing how to react to certain things and seeing the consequences of that. So I think there is some benefit to addressing these things in your yeah. health journey to maybe not continue to pass it on to the next generations. Um, but when you say there's things you can do about it, I think this is a great segue into talking about solutions to a lot of these problems. So in the beginning, we were talking about like the, the, negative spiral of low thyroid function and then increase serotonin, increase endotoxin, increase estrogen, and then it kind of just spiraling back. Yep. Um, for, the, for the suppression of thyroid. Yeah. yeah. And so as we were talking about big pharma, what was coming to mind is kind of how we actually don't see thyroid hormone other than T4 prescribed that often for, or even people really recognizing and diagnosing hypothyroidism due to the skewed lab, you know, normal results. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, I would argue that a lot of people would benefit from taking something like thyroid with a T3, so whether that's a desiccated or a synthetic supplement, in some situations and maybe see a lot of these different diseases or allergies that are caused by the increased histamine or increased serotonin alleviate over time as we improve the metabolic rate. Georgie, can you touch on why like the metabolic rate and thyroid health would help l- hinder and break this cycle so why is that important for digestion because people well, the, the thyroid, those as separate 
Yeah. So the thyroid hormone, if it's in sufficient amounts, it actually has direct suppressive effects on many of the enzymes that release these inflammatory mediators. Um, so yeah, T3 has an has an inhibitory effect on aromatase, so it will be lower it will be lowering estrogen. T3 has an inhibitory effect on the enzyme uh, tryptophan hydroxylase, so which synthesizes serotonin, so it will lower the serotonin. Uh, uh, the T3 has an inhibitory effect on histidine decarboxylase, so it will lower the histamine. Now, uh, people say, well, you don't want this to be lowered. No, you don't, uh, you're right. You don't want them to zero. But also because if, if we assume that we're chronically overproducing them because of our suboptimal lifestyles and our suboptimal diets and stress and whatnot, then we probably can, can use a little bit lower, right? And thyroid hormone has all of these characteristics. It modulates them. If they're too low, it can actually increase the activity of the, enzyme, of the enzymes. If you have really low histamine, which can also be a problem, right? Uh, then the thyroid hormone can provide you with a little bit more histamine. But if it's too high, it actually can modulate the rate back to normal. Uh, and it, speaking of all these mediators, people say, oh, man, it's a mess. How can I trace this, like, chase 50 different uh, bogeyman here running around? Like, this is impossible. Pharma comes says, no, perfect. <laughs> In fact, they're not 50. They're, 50, they're 5,000. And we have a drug for every single one of them. But that's clearly not the solution. I mean, uh, I, yeah. I, I don't think many people will argue that we are over-medicated to the point where our drugs are creating many of the conditions that we're having, we're struggling with, because nobody really knows how they interact. It's impossible to actually truly prove how even two drugs interact on a long-term basis if you take them for years or even decades. But most people that I know that are over the age of 50 or doctor has told them that you know, they have a high risk of heart disease or cancer or whatnot, they're taking at least four or five. They're taking a, a statin, which is like almost a universal thing for cholesterol, right? They're taking a blood pressure medication because most people's blood pressure tends to increase with age. Why? Well, blood, the vasodilation. And I, as I said, if you're not producing carbon dioxide, which depends on the thyroid rate, on the thyroid function, then your blood pressure is going to go up adaptively. So instead of raising your metabolic rate, the doctor's like, no, we're going to worry about the blood pressure. So here's this drug. So three drugs so far. Uh, a lot of people are taking proton pump inhibitors for for acid situations. Like basically, a lot of people have indigestion and they call it GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. In fact, that's the most commonly prescribed drug in the world, the PPI inhibitor. Uh, claimed to be perfectly benign. It doesn't do anything except like lower your, the production of, of acid in the stomach. That by itself is bad because the acid in your stomach is one of the primary defense mechanisms against the foreign invaders. So when you're eating food, no matter how well prepared, it's going to have some bacteria in it. And if there's nothing to kill that bacteria, and the, the hydrochloric acid in the stomach is very good at killing the bacteria, that bacteria can actually, over time, colonize your small intestine, which is very, very bad. It results in a condition called small intestine bacterial overgrowth. And basically, over time, you're going to, get, you're going to have everything, potentially even your stomach, colonized by bacteria, which means that no matter what you eat, you don't even get time to digest it because it's already feeding the bacteria and you're creating endotoxin, no matter which part of the GI tract this whole situation is. So yeah. four drugs that are most people are taking. We talked about the, S the SSRIs. I think 42% of women in the age group of 18 to 62 are taking a, an SSRI. An additional, yeah, half of them, basically. An additional 30 to 40% are taking anti-anxiety medication as well. Uh, unfortunately, many of those are now being switched over to something called clonopin, which is a, a, a GABA drug. It's used for anxiety, but it's a very new generation drug, which is so potent that once you start taking it, it's almost impossible to wean off. Go to Google and type clonopin withdrawal, spelled with a K, and click on the videos. You know, it's not for the faint of heart, but you'll see how people who say that this drug is not doing, is not working well for them, they're telling the doctor, I, I don't want it. I'm going to stop it cold turkey. Uh, and then they're going into like seizures and withdrawals and they're acting all crazy. So it's basically we, we got into a situation where we're taking five, six or seven or more drugs on a regular basis. All these drugs have, have known side effects. They're not being announced, right? So that itself contributes to the kind of like ongoing situation where people say like, no matter what I do, I'm not getting better. Yeah. Well, if that is the case, that's not because of your genes. This means there's something else going on. And very often, more often than not, it's whatever you're taking in terms of prescription drug. The drug themselves have very bad side effects. But the excipients, which we've been told is completely benign. Don't you ever worry about the excipient in your drug, like the thing that are that makes the pill the pill, right? Yeah. It's a very small portion oh, of the like pill. Oh, like how the, the medicine is delivered and uh -huh, packaged. Exactly, yeah. yes. So, ta ta talc. Now there's a huge cl uh, cl uh, class action lawsuit against uh, PG&E. To the point where they actually, uh, uh, no, Procter & Gamble, yeah. Which actually, they tried to spin off the division that was selling talc and bankrupt it to avoid paying in the, uh, to, to avoid paying the, 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 the uh, uh, 
the class action lawsuit because millions of women got got ovarian cancer because of talc powders. So that's how benign talc is. It can give you ovarian cancer. Type ovarian cancer class action lawsuit and it will come up. It's, it's a, oh, it's, here's the really nasty part. PG&E knew about this. PG&E knew about this for decades. PG&E paid for fake studies to be published to convince the public that talc is benign. So talc is a very common ingredient in pharmaceuticals. Titanium dioxide, very common ingredient. Excipient really means something additional outside of the drug that's kind of either buffers it or like makes it stay stable so you can take it as a pill or like other kind of formulation. So talc and titanium dioxide universally claimed to be completely benign and have nothing to do with your health are now known to actually directly cause cancer. And titanium dioxide, a recent study demonstrated that in amounts much smaller than what is actually present in a pill can actually trigger diabetes over time by triggering this chronic irritation of the intestine, which results in a chronic inflammatory reaction. And, you know, credit to medicine that now medicine says, yes, we agree, chronic inflammation is very bad. It will give you every disease under the, under the sky that we know about, right? But we don't know what's causing the chronic inflammation. Now, little by little, it turns out that most pharmaceutical drugs are actually perfectly capable by the active ingredient or the excipients, the inactive ingredient, to be causing all of these health problems that we're, that we're having. I know uh, that. I can't count how many people I know that have actually... Either went to the doctor and asked for a drug that is in pure form from a compound in pharmacy yeah. or stop these drugs altogether. They they immediately improved. I, I don't want to say they got cured, <laughs> but they said, oh, my God, I can eat like a normal person again. I don't have to sit like a little mouse and like look at this massive choice of food in the store. I'm like, can't eat that, can't eat that, can't eat that. But what can I eat? Yeah, I know uh, that there's down, yeah. a lot of those additional ingredients in regular supplements too that you can buy off of line or like the health food supplements that yes, have the... I forgot to say these same yeah. recipients are actually universally used in the food and drug industry yeah uh, and basically it's you, you go to you go to a supplement store look at the at, at the label um and basically it's going to have ta- usually talc titanium dioxide silicon dioxide is another one silicon dioxide is very commonly used in the food industry as an anti-caking agent so it's present in things like potato chips uh it's present in things like bread Especially things like yeah. pizza, but you actually, what is silicon dioxide? Powdered glass. Does that sound like something that's good for your that's intestines? Crazy. Hold on. So, okay. So basically, some people from the start, from their birth, they're kind of set up for a rougher start yeah. because yeah. of generations of mm-hmm. poor metabolic rates, poor thyroid functions, and then. From the start, we're fed all of this crap food with all these horrible ingredients. We're stuffed with drugs with all these bad ingredients. Mm -hmm. And it's just making this cycle of serotonin, estrogen, endotoxin, histamine. It's just making it worse in the long run. And it's just having these potentially short-term suppression of the symptoms with these long-term costs. Yeah, because the medicine tries to deal with the symptoms because if it cannot de- define what the cause is and, and um, you know, many people say, well, medicine wants to cure people and, and my community, and I think you would agree, and in general, people that are more, more suspicious will say, I don't think so. It doesn't sound like a good business model. You, you don't want to cure your patients. You want to maintain your patients. And I got uh, I got told so many times by really established people saying, George, you're out of your mind. This means that most people, most of these companies are psychopathic. And then the company came out with a cure for hepatitis C. Uh, I think the company is called Gilead, G-I-L-E-A-D, an actual cure for hepatitis C. Immediately, a huge article in Bloomberg by Goldman Sachs, probably the premier investment bank in the world, saying, what a terrible idea. Like, why would you do something? Uh, from a financial perspective, they actually roasted this company and said, you guys are finished. We're going to dump your stock because we have never seen such a dumb decision done by, by a financially minded company. Why would you cure your patients? You're out of your mind. I'll send you the article. It's still there. Uh, yeah. And I showed it to these people and they said, wow, well, I guess, yeah, from a financial perspective, it really doesn't make sense for you to cure your clients, right? To, 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 to get rid of your clients. That's what you're doing if you're a pharma company. So um, on that topic, I've seen a lot of information going around about how there's going to be a vaccine that helps treat all these different fungal infections like candida, stuff mm-hmm. that pretty much this environment in this world is creating right. and all the different, I know it could be labeled as a conspiracy theory or whatever that they're in these chemtrails, they're spraying different things into the environment that's inevitably going into our food sources and just in us. Yeah. Um, have you heard about that new vaccine for fungal infections? So I heard about many different vaccines that are based on the mRNA technology. And yeah. it looks like the companies were ready with these vaccines to go forward. 
but they were waiting for the pandemic to kind of allow pharma companies to sell untested products. Because now we have it established. We have a case precedent where basically if the situation is considered dire and who decides whether it's dire or not, not us, right? Uh, then a pharma company can be allowed to sell something on the market without undergoing the regular testing, which is for a regular clinical <laughs> trial, you're talking about years, right? Um, for I think for vaccine, they estimated between eight and 10 years from like, having the idea of the vaccine to getting it to market. And of course, billions of dollars of cost. But now all of this is being scrapped. Now all these companies are saying, oh, we have this exciting technology. Why don't you come here? Uh, you know, yeah. inject, inject. Um, yeah, I heard about the Candida. Inject, and, uh, in inject, fact, inject. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, no. that's, and then something happens. Oh, it's a coincidence. It's global warming. Well, it's the be fact global that warming. you say that is really funny, like creating this hysteria and this need for something immediately. There's this show that my boyfriend and I are watching called The Last of Us. And it's about a fungal infection that takes over. And then, of course, it leads to some like a zombie apocalypse situation, yeah. which seems absurd. <laughs> However, what we know about different fungus and how they can um, basically alter different species' minds, like the fungus in ants or fungus in um, different mayflies, for well, example. That, that takes over the, the brain and makes them go to, turn Correct. into zombies, right? Yeah, so what I see potentially happening is this like fear and this hysteria being created through the show which people are kind of realizing like oh like could something like this actually happen and so we really do need to be able to have this vaccine ready to treat these different infections that are scaring people i mean bingo yeah i mean so, so, so do you know this is so now you realize that all of these shows are subtle marketing for something that's further coming down the line it's not a conspiracy yeah. theory there was a meeting between big pharma and hollywood way back i think it was in the 60s where they discussed how they can clo- work together more closely i honestly um, believe it and i mean just we started looking more and more into bacterial fungus infections all these different things when we moved into this house which had mold in it which obviously you know led to estrogen dominance led to a more hypometabolic state allowed yep. these overgrowths to happen and so it does create a fear but what it really takes is being aware of what allows these things to overgrow in your body in the first place. And so yeah. it was funny reading an article that said like, oh, you know, don't be afraid. A lot of these overgrowths will not be able to affect humans because humans have this higher body temperature. We have the 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. But I'm thinking to myself, well, probably 85% of the population does not have a body temperature. Yeah. Of not anymore. Exactly. Maybe for a healthy person when they're like, I don't know, five years old. Yeah. Not anymore. Our temperature is going lower. And if you look at the, uh, uh, do you see that study that I posted on the blog? I think Dr. P mentioned as well. Our body temperature these days is about uh, two degrees lower than what it was a hundred years ago. And, uh, and the, the, the trend audience, is accelerating. Yeah. For the audience, like your metabolic rate and your thyroid function a very easy way to measure that is your body temperature. And if you look at the trends from the last 100 years, it's a steady decline. And now mainstream is saying, oh, no, no, it's just... It's just a natural result. It's it's normal now to be in the low 97s well, no, and 96s. It's like, it's like how they change the different lab levels. It's just the average, so it's normal, but the average is not normal nor good. And now you and now you can kind of start to understand, well, since the body is a system with a huge change in our body temperature, that's affecting how enzymes are working exactly. inside of our body. Exactly. That's going to yeah. downregulate certain processes required for digestion. It's going to slow down our digestive rate, mm-hmm. which is then going to increase the amount of endotoxin, endotoxin production, exactly. serotonin, yeah. histamine. Yeah. Yeah. And so it is all this negative, horrible spiral. That... Ah. So I do have a question related to that, and it's related to Big Pharma too. So you were saying, I don't know, some crazy amount, 45% of the women are on SSRIs or something. 42 percent of the age group between 20 and 64. Okay, so that is the age group that women conceive and have children. And I remember listening to Ray, who was saying that thyroid and progesterone is actually uh, very much downplayed and told not to give to pregnant women when that could improve the outcome of their child, whereas we're prescribing things like SSRIs with no consideration of the negative endocrine effects yeah yeah exactly. and so can you explain a little bit why we might be told to fear things like thyroid hormone and progesterone throughout our pregnancy well similar to i think some of the stuff came uh, out of analysis of lsd and other things that were found to be pro-metabolic so some of the fear came from that, that they said well if you, if you look at people that are hyperthyroid 
Um, some of these people have heart problems. Some of these people have bone problems. Some of these people have like skin problems. Uh, some, some of these people have mental health issues. But then back in the 1960s, they didn't have a very reliable way of diagnosing hypothyroidism. So uh, many of these people that were, di that were diagnosed with Graves' disease, which is the hyperthyroidism, were later found to improve by taking thyroid hormones. So they were actually hypothyroid. Yeah. And it's really uh, the way to legitimately diagnose hypothyroidism it probably involves a combination of blood tests, uh, core body temperature, heart rate, and also the Achilles tendon reflex, which is basically after somebody, you know, they, they tap you on the heel and then, you know, you, your body, uh, is, your foot flexes and then basically how quick rela relaxes it is indication of how good your thyroid function is. People with low thyroid function have spastic muscles. So basically there, and, and in fact, it's one of the, one of the very, very, very reliable symptoms of neurological disease, such as multiple sclerosis, and they're known to improve by giving people thyroid. So really like that's the physiological testing for, for, for hypothyroidism. If you actually do it, just as you said, probably 80, 90% will come down with, uh, will basically be classified as, as in a, on the hypothyroid spectrum. Very few people these days are, have normal thyroid function. And the ones that do, they cannot really tolerate the uh, modern city, Western environment. They, they tend to, you know, like uh, run out into the woods and, you know, they don't want to come back. They sense that this situation is not, is not healthy for them. Mm -hmm. Constant stress, constant anxiety, crappy food. Um, and whenever you have, a, you have a problem, the doctor has a pill for you, usually more than one. And then these pills make you worse. And then you, it's madness. Like, it's, you don't know where to start. Everything yeah. around you is an assault on, ver on the very nature of you. So the, Really, well thyroid, the you thyroid people are saying, I, I, I don't want to have anything to Peace do with Peace out. This. So, yeah, yeah. would you say then that taking thyroid and progesterone during pregnancy then would be safe? Huge. Uh, I, just progesterone by itself, I, I don't think even a regular doctor will be able to convince you to not take it because basically progesterone to this day is the only established treatment for eclampsia and preeclampsia or premature labor. Hmm. Uh, it's known that suboptimal levels of estrogen cause spontaneous abortions. So the, the treatment that they're now, that is still approved. Suboptimal yeah, levels of progesterone. Intravenous, intra, given progesterone intravenously. Or back in the day, they were giving vitamin E and magnesium, which, by the way, happened to work like progesterone and opposed estrogen. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so basically this. Uh, thyroid. No, go ahead. go ahead. This like serotonin, um, histamine. And endotoxin cycle is estrogen is also involved in there, and so oh yes, all using... three of these things activate the enzyme aromatase, so that you're going to be producing more estrogen. Mm -hmm. um, and estrogen inhibits the synthesis of progesterone from pregnenolone. In fact, estrogen inhibits the, the synthesis of anything from cholesterol. And then, when you basically when you give people estrogen, their cholesterol will actually tend to rise, or at least the, the downstream conversion of the cholesterol will get inhibited. So you're not going to be able to get enough progesterone if you get if you get a lot of estrogen in your body. Yeah. So to my understanding, to give some practical suggestions to people who are listening, for my own self and a lot of people that we work with in our course, my understanding is that we need to break this cycle somewhere, right? And so for me, what that's looked like is after my mold exposure, after being very hypometabolic and undernourished for pro you know, my entire life, um very estrogen dominant despite having low estrogen levels obviously because i never produce progesterone to mediate and so yeah. supplementing with progesterone bioidentical progesterone like progest e or your progesterone product from idea labs is crucial basically to stop the estrogen cycle and then also simultaneously obviously working on your metabolic rate whether that requires you to temporarily or forever supplement thyroid hormone um, and then utilizing things like the charcoal you were bringing up and the carrot salad to help reduce the endotoxin. And I feel like mm -hmm. instead of us chasing these things like the DAO enzyme and all these different histamine, yeah. um, degrading enzymes, right? So the, the, yeah. there's probably uh, there's probably these ten that we don't yet know about. Yeah, I mean I've seen studies that are saying when they look at a, like an analysis of a, of a of a blood sample, they're 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 seeing these thousands of molecules that are similar in molecular mass to the the, the DIO enzyme, diamine oxidase, and they're saying it's they're probably very structurally similar. If they are, that means these are also processing, right? So if you're chasing just one of them, there's no guarantee that the others are not going to be able to work just as well, and you're basically doing stuff in vain, potentially making things worse because you're you know 
take an intervention that's steering you off balance, right? Yeah. Uh, but even if people don't that don't want to use hormones, uh, something as simple as aspirin, daily aspirin has been shown to reliably mimic many of the effects of progesterone, mostly because aspirin actually also inhibits aromatase, but also the molecule structurally, even though aspirin is much simpler structurally, tends to have many of the effects that progesterone does without actually aspirin being a hormone. You could uh, plants produce it and use it for very similar purposes as the humans do with progesterone. Plant, uh, it, in plants, aspirin, or its metabolite salicylic acid, is an actual hormone that helps the plants defend against any foreign invader, increase their resilience to stress, uh, improve their metabolic rate, improve the, the yield of their seeds, and whatnot. And in fact, since you're on the farm, uh, I'll send you some old articles that are showing that actually new articles now confirming that if you dip the seeds before you plant them in a solution of aspirin, these plants after that are indestructible. Oh. There is no there is no fungi or any kind of a thing that can eat them. That's <laughs> basically The only thing I, I have to do a commercial video of somebody trying to hack the plant with an axe and the axe breaks. And That's then you're going to have like a blockbuster product. Yeah. <laughs> it's, there, there are recent studies too. So whatever, all of these effects that we're seeing in the plants of the aspirin, where aspirin is, as salicylic acid is known as a pro-health, you know, stress uh, resisting hormone, they're the same in humans. Uh, but we have just have more more metabolic pathways and more things to worry about. So then, at what point of this cycle does aspirin help? Oh, so aspirin increases the metabolic rate directly. So it increases the rate of glycolysis, but also increases the rate of the Krebs cycle and increases the function of the electron transport chain. So the entire cascade of the metabolic rate from food to oxygen is being pushed by aspirin, right? Uh, aspirin has an anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, and the anti-inflammatory effect, all of these inflammatory mediators, specifically the prostaglandins that, that aspirin directly inhibits the synthesis of, and also the leukotriens, both of these derived from PUFA, uh, aspirin decreases the synthesis of these inflammatory mediators, and the inflammatory mediators wreak havoc on the body. They have fibrotic effects, they directly uh, they can antagonize the uh, effect of the thyroid hormone T3 at the receptor level, they're that nasty, uh, they cause fibrosis, they increase the synthesis of nitric oxide, histamine, <laughs> serotonin, etc. So it's really aspirin is kind of like a it's a chain breaker because you can you should be able to break this chain of nasty uh, this cycle because it has maybe like twenty different components. But you attack one of them really well, and then usually the rest kind of dissipate by themselves because they feed off of each other. Yeah, aspirin is one of one of one such thing. So I think we all agree that like the ultimate solution in breaking this cycle is improving our metabolic rate, yes. improving our thyroid function, which can be monitored by our body temperature and pulse rate. Mm -hmm. However, for some people, their cycle is so bad that they take one step forward and then the cycle takes them one step back. Well, they it's take because yeah. all of these different things contribute to a low metabolic rate. Yeah. Yeah, all of them. And if you can address one or more in a very fundamental way, which progesterone, aspirin, vitamin E can do, then usually, usually it allows you to break out of the cycle. Now, if you're carrying a lot of metabolic baggage, or if you've been like this for a long time, yep. the system has memory and maybe kind of inclined to fall back into the cycle, right? But if you do this for a while, eventually you will break out free. Um, what would you say? So for people who need supplemental support to break out of this cycle, what would you give as like the hierarchy of things to try? Like aspirin, progesterone, vitamin E. Like, what would you say is number one to try? Then number two, number three. I was gonna say find somebody, find somebody you're in love with, and run away into the woods for a couple of months. You'll probably come back a new person. I think so. <laughs> I am I'm not joking. I am, I am really not joking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I have friends who have mine who I went to college with. They had very serious metabolic problems. Uh, just actually diagnosed with very serious problems in general at the time. We didn't know they're metabolic. One of them is a mountain climber. He went into mountains of Central Asia. And basically, like, he's from Italy originally. And he now only leaves the mountain. He's so, he's like, dude, I don't know how you stay there. I'm like, why? He's like, I, I can't even begin to describe it. Everything around you is poison. I I I'm kind of, I'm like, yeah, I kind of know. He's like, no, you don't know. You have to come and spend some time in the wilderness. And then you will see that everything in you will say, uh, I don't think it's worth it going back. So he doesn't. And I know other people that did the same. Not in the mountains, but... Uh, you know, people who basically had a very routine, uh, kind of like a job, started developing health problems, and like, well, I don't know what's wrong. And then they have like a this really nice and romantic relationship and run away for a while, and then they don't want to come back. <laughs> they say, yeah. well, why don't you want to come back? It's like, for what? <laughs> this stuff is killing everybody. Don't you get it? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I, I remember Kate Deering would bring up a lot too. Like, if you would just go on vacation, 
and experience, you know, a different life, allow your body to relax, see the sun more, maybe you'd be yeah. surprised at how much the the body could just heal itself in that short amount of time. And then, of course, you have to come back to your reality, which is unfortunate, and maybe see some of that digress. But yeah, it is. But you at least you will know you've seen yeah. the system from the outside. So you'll know what to protect yourself from. Yeah, it's like mitigate the difference. Because right now when you're in, basically everything around you, the only thing you can see is what's around you. So it's difficult to use information from the system to fight the system, yeah. right? You got to get outside and see a different perspective. Oh, definitely. Um, I so think it's, leave... it's also very eye-opening when that situation might happen to recognize like, oh, it's actually not, there's not something wrong with my body. Yeah. It's not like a defective body, but it's the environment I'm in or that this world has created. Or the things that we're putting in the body. Yeah, that has caused Everything. this effect. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 And then I know quite a few people like that. I mean, of course, they eventually have to come back. Some of them don't. Like this guy in, in Tianshan Mountains in, uh, in Kyrg- I think Kyrgyzstan. Um, and then a few other people who went to the Caribbean, one of them to, cent- to Central America. And they're like, no, I'm not coming back. I can I can find work here. But I, what I noticed by going back and forth, I just some, everything in me, just when I fly back into civilization, it just feels revolting. I, I don't want to do it. Okay, so, so yeah. run so away. Aside from that, <laughs> aside from that, things that really work on inflammation and oppose as many of, as of these inflammatory mediators as possible. Aspen is a very cardinal thing. Uh, vitamin D, really a, a, a cardinal thing. It's actually a steroid. Most people know it as a vitamin, but it's uh, it's actually called a secosteroid. Seco in Latin means broken. So if you look at the structure of vitamin D, steroids have four rings, and vitamin D has two rings and then two that are half. So it's a broken steroid, but it, it's capable of having all of the effects that progesterone does, which means increasing the metabolic rate, preventing from uh, spontaneous abortion, uh, controlling inflammation. Really, a lot of research coming out on vitamin D showing that it's really a versatile molecule. It's just like thyroid. It's hardly There's hardly a cell in the body, no matter what tissue it comes from, where vitamin E does not have a protective or restorative effect. If, if the system, if the cell is already uh, under stress or diseased, um, what else? Uh, the, the other, the other fat soluble vitamins E, A, and K are also very important. Uh, the vitamin E, about a hundred years ago, was known as the in the, uh, the naturally widely available estrogen antagonist, uh, and not until like late eighties and even now, like uh, early two thousands, was uh, uh, we didn't know until now that actually because now medicine works with receptors and enzymes and whatnot. Um, back in the day, you just noticed that vitamin D opposes all of the bad effects that given, you know, that large dose of estrogen um, cause to the animals. So they said it's a function of estrogen antagonist. Now we know that vitamin E is actually directly capable of binding the estrogen receptors and blocking estrogen from activating them. So it's an estrogen receptor antagonist. It also it is also an aromatase inhibitor, so it actually decrease the amount of estrogen that we synthesize. Mm. Um, it protects from the peroxidation of the unsaturated fats and also in, uh, inhibits the enzymes, just like aspirin, that take the polyunsaturated fats as input and spit out these inflammatory molecules like the prostaglandins and the leukotriones. Really versatile molecule, but all the fat soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K, they kind of work together and they all have this chain breaking effect of the stress field. Um, so it, that, it's just a, maybe maybe 10 different compounds that even if you use only one or two of them, I tell people like, look, I have never met a person who I have not seen improve by taking a tablet of aspirin for two weeks daily. I've never seen, a, no matter how severe the condition is, just the, the, the very restorative effect that aspirin has. And it's such a broad action, right? That it's not only, doesn't work only on one system to, to disbalance the body, just like the pharma drug would do, right? It actually works on many of these things to modulate them back into the healthy uh, uh, well, range. It's just, it's just helpful to understand that there is this negative spiral and that mm-hmm. aspirin is addressing that feed, feedback cycle. Yeah. Because then you the, just have this negative, aspirin, I think it's such a negative light. But when you yeah. understand, oh, wait, this is a really nasty cycle and aspirin can help you break it, well, then you understand its use. I think aspirin gets a bad rep because it's compared to in the mainstream as like Tylenol and all these other different yeah. drugs. Whereas, could you explain maybe why it's not the same as that? Well, I mean, the, the pharma industry has actually has now has the, not declassified, but they've released information under the FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, where there's been a concerted campaign to badmouth aspirin for decades. That, that's how... It, the only reason why a pharma company would do that is, I don't need to tell you, it's not because they're worried about your health. <laughs> it's because aspirin is threatening maybe sales or who knows what. But aspirin is now vilified as a drug that will kill you through bleeding. You take one baby aspirin and you increase risk of bleeding, and that's deadly, right? 
Uh, but then subsequent studies with humans demonstrated that actually aspirin prevents, uh, it may increase the, the chance of bleeding slightly, but actually prevents the exact lethal bleeding things that other drugs, such as warfarin or Xarelto, all these other blood thinners that are now in vogue, all of them actually have as a side effect. So aspirin may slightly increase your bleeding risk, but it protects you from dying. Uh, while having all these other benefits that the other drugs don't. And I think the the because aspirin is such a threat, because it works, it's such a cardinal pro-health, pro-metabolic stimulator, uh, medicine hates it. It cannot patent it. It cannot sell it as a drug. So what the only thing is to do is to convince people not to use it, right? Um, and, you know, it, it can really kill quite a few branches of the farm industry. So anything that has to do with cardiovascular disease, I mean, I don't need to tell you. Everybody knows you take aspirin for heart, right? to prevent heart attack or like treat a heart attack, right? But now they're saying, oh, aspirin also has such a broad anti-inflammatory effect that basically can prevent type 2 diabetes. Huge, 30% of Americans are basically pre-diabetic. It's, it's expected to be num- the number one chronic condition in the next five years. Um, so aspirin can actually prevent that. Pharma doesn't have a drug that prevents diabetes. Then they're looking at neurodegenerative disease. They're showing that a baby aspirin a day virtually eliminates your risk of developing Alzheimer's. Pharma doesn't have a drug for Alzheimer's. They're saying it's incurable. It's impossible to prevent. So then they're looking at Parkinson's disease. Again, studies showing taking a baby aspirin can prevent Parkinson's disease. So the only way for aspirin to actually work on so many different diseases, this kind of tells you, immediately tells you one thing. All diseases fundamentally have the same cause, right? And aspirin is somehow addressing it. It's not that aspirin is this magic molecule that no matter what pathological pathway you find, aspirin is somehow already designed to attack it and you know break it. It's more the fact that aspirin works on very kind of high level uh, conductors of health, thyroid being one, right? Inflammation being another one. So if you address these things at the very top, then for the downstream, uh, this prevents kind of like downstream degeneration and the expanding of the tree of disease. Mm -hmm. Because at at every layer for the lower of the tree, you have more things to address. And I know medicine likes it because every disease, if it has one drug, then, you know, medicine makes a ton of money, but that's not how the human body works. In fact, uh, recently, they started classifying all of the autoimmune diseases as a single condition. Something that Dr. Pete and other pro-metabolic people have been saying for decades. They're saying, look, there is no metabolic difference between rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. And our medicine is saying, we agree. Of course, they don't quote Dr. Pete. They're saying, oh, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, multiple sclerosis, all of the, uh, uh, all, uh, what is the other one? Um, psoriatic arthritis. All of these things are actually the same condition. So we're going to use one drug to treat them all. Now, they didn't do this to, to, to help you or, you or I. They did it because they approved the drug for one condition and they wanted to sell it for all the others. And up until recently, uh, actually, I think the rules are still in place. You can't sell one drug for another condition unless you also test it for that condition. So what's the other way to do this? To claim that all conditions are the same. So uh-huh. that the drug is approved. Uh-huh. <laughs> wow, that advanced quickly. That's smart. <laughs> Check it out. It's now all the immune conditions that are called a part of the same spectrum of disease. And Humira, which is, they did it because of Humira specifically, very famous drug for autoimmune conditions, was developed for Crohn's disease, specifically for Crohn's disease. But it was such a blockbuster, it makes so much money, the pharmacist said, we have to be able to sell it for other diseases. And FDA said, only if you pay for clinical trials for all of these other diseases. And, and, and pharma said, not to be outdone, pharma said, hmm, what if we tell you that all diseases are the same? We've already approved it for one, so... <laughs> So now we got like 20 different diseases that we can sell it for. And they're, they're happy. You know, they're making more money. I promise but, this is not an aspirin commercial. Yes. It's just helpful <laughs> to understand why it has worked for such a long period of time. And it you understand that it can't be patented. And so therefore, pharma won't push it as being helpful because they can't make money off of it. Isn't it come from willow bark? Yeah, the willow bark contains salicylic acid, which I mentioned is the plant hormone. Yep. Aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid. It's the acetyl ester. But in your body, when you ingest it, within 15 minutes in your stomach, breaks down into acetic acid and salicylic acid. It's really a pro-drug. Just like T4 converts into T3, and really the T3 is the active drug. Mm-hmm. In aspirin, most of the benefits are coming from salicylic acid into which into metabolizes mm-hmm. as you ingest it. So your suggestions for helping to support your body break this cycle would be aspirin and fat soluble vitamin supplementation that's probably the most benign and widely available and cheapest thing they can try magnesium is another one but unfortunately most people will reach for a magnesium supplement and those invariably have the talc titanium dioxide silicon dioxide all the other crap what you can do is try to drink well water 
um, if it's coming from a relatively rocky area, like the well is from a you know from a rocky area in the ground, chances are it already has a lot of minerals, specifically calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate already dissolved. So you'll be getting like a very nice solution of all of these electrolytes without having to take a toxic supplement. Mm. 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 Yeah, I mean, so and then foods too that have these fat soluble vitamins, obviously things like butter, yeah. liver. Uh, all organs yeah. uh, i don't know of any organ that's really bad to eat and in fact uh when in in the wild when predators kill their prey they first eat the organs they then they like leave the carcass sometimes they will actually you know bury the carcass and come and eat it later but in in marine animals in marine predators and land predators whenever they they kill their prey they usually tend to eat the heart and the liver first and the the digestive tract and then they leave the carcass for later because they think it's uh you know, I guess uh, if we, if we believe animals think like us, I think they believe this is second grade food. Uh, and back in the day, muscle meats were actually considered a really poor food food for poor people. Yeah. The rich were eating organs. The rich were eating the collagenous uh, kind of portions of the animal. The filet mignon, that is now probably the most expensive thing you can get in the steakhouse, were actually back in the day was food for poor people. Uh, they were giving it to dogs too. So yeah. I think it's important to understand, like with these different types of different parts of the animal. Mm-hmm. Um, the muscle is high in certain amino acids like methionine, tryptophan, cysteine, and then kind of the tendons and the connective tissue and then making bone broth from the bones. That's high in a lot of anti-inflammatory amino acids like glycine. Can you explain why having like imbalanced amino acids can negatively impact this estrogen, serotonin, histamine yeah. cycle? So just eating filet mignons and not really... Even things like chicken breasts and yeah stuff. So the serotonin can only get synthesized from the amino acid L-tryptophan. L-tryptophan is the only amino acid that is directly carcinogenic. I think that that tells you enough of how good tryptophan is, and you know by extension how good serotonin is. No other amino acid has direct carcinogenic effects except L-tryptophan. However, the muscle meats contain not only a lot of tryptophan but also a lot of cysteine and a lot of methionine, and these three the Holy Trinity, the the holy the devilish Trinity that I call them, uh, they actually all three are anti-metabolic. They directly inhibit the synthesis of thyroid hormone uh, into the thyroid gland. In fact, you can give yourself hypothyroidism by consuming large amounts of cysteine, which is available not only in muscle meats but also in sulfur-containing vegetables such as cabbage, uh, uh, what is it, Brussels Brussels sprouts? I think they're also called. Uh, cauliflower. All all these contain a lot of the sulfur-containing amino acids, such as cysteine and methionine. Uh, And in fact, one of the old remedies for hyperthyroidism, or at least uh, if you overdose with thyroid hormone, they'll give you a lot of cysteine. Um, And it's now sold on the the market as slightly modified version. It's called NAC, N-acetylcysteine. They sell it as an antioxidant, but it's a very heavily anti-thyroid effect. So the back in the day was used to basically bring somebody who is hyperthyroid under control. Conversely, if a person with normal thyroid takes cysteine, methionine, or tryptophan, or eats the muscle meats that are a rich source of that, or these vegetables that I mentioned, they're going to get themselves into a hypometabolic situation directly. No one no one here is saying don't eat muscle meat. It's just if, yes. you are, it. if you are struggling with your metabolic rate, you should really be considerate of how you're balancing your amino acid intake and making sure that you exactly. are prioritizing a lot of glycine and making sure you're getting bone broth in. Yes. And honestly, just like eat ground beef. Like if you're like if you're gonna eat muscle meat, save money and just eat ground beef over a tenderloin and chicken breast. Because the yeah, ground beef has they, so much of the make, connective exactly, tissue. Exactly, collagen. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's the cheaper part. They, uh, the, our market system is kind of flipped upside down. Uh, you know, if you buy the pure meat, it's more expensive. But the ground beef, in which they grind skin, <laughs> ears, I don't know, whatever they have, like the cheaper stuff, it actually turns out to be, you know, the one that's better for us. So it's better to get good ground beef from the store, uh, especially, well, I don't know if it's organic is any better, but because I, I looked at it, they taste the same to me. I've tested them in the lab. They aren't that much different in terms of the heavy metals or any contamination. So good ground beef is likely to be healthier for you than any of the pure muscle meats, unless we're talking about stuff like, uh, you know, piece of meat with the skin on top, which some people do with pork. Um, or, you know, you're getting some of the real, the tougher cuts of the beef, like skirt steak, I think is very, also very cheap because yeah. people don't like it. They're saying, oh, it's very tough to chew. Yeah. Oh yeah. You got yeah. things like the shanks and oxtail and all these gelatinous cuts, yes. which mm-hmm. are kind of for most people who didn't grow up cooking, probably intimidating. But I mean, if you just slow cook that and break the collagen down to gelatin, it's actually really delicious. 
Yeah, that's probably one reason why people prefer most of these other pure meats because they tend to cook more quickly, oh, definitely. right? Yeah. And in a busy lifestyle, like what the really the, what the civilization is all about is basically driving you insane by running around twenty four seven. Then basically you reach for the things that are very easy and quick to cook, right? So the the purer meats are relatively quicker to cook than the more more gelatinous stuff, which is especially oxtail, oxtail or bone broth. You gotta boil it for hours. People will say, oh, I don't have hours for that yeah well then don't be surprised that the uh, health is in the shambles yeah definitely and so in addition to like paying attention to your protein also make sure you're consuming easy to digest food so that way these bacteria overgrowths don't proliferate and get worse and also uh, if you're taking i really think the ppi drugs the proton pump inhibitors the anti-acid drugs are really nasty they can actually give you the endotoxemia even if you're it was started as a healthy person without a lot of metabolic baggage because they inhibit the production of the uh, stomach acid and that allows the bacteria from the food to colonize your small intestine which is even worse than being in the in the colon because we always have some bacteria there and kind of the colon has like a thicker layer of cells to protect but the small intestine where most of the absorption of the food happens, um, basically, so you don't want any bacteria there. Um, and by taking these anti-acid drugs, you're really decimating the production of acid and you're giving yourself a an intestinal overgrowth, which is kind of hard to get rid of afterwards. See, only antibiotics, to my knowledge, can actually do it. Or taking a lot of charcoal, taking a lot of, uh, mm-hmm. you know, eating a lot of insoluble fiber. So if you're taking a PPI drug, talk to your doctor potentially about switching to the older g- drugs, which of course invariably always turn out to be better for us than the latest and greatest crap. The so-called histamine antagonist, speaking of histamine, um, the first, these drugs yeah. like uh, specifically famotidine, uh, recently, uh, you know, acquired a little fame because it was demonstrated to actually stop the, the COVID-19 disease. In fact, there have now several clinical trials with famotidine to actually prevent people from dying, even the people that are susceptible. And the, in addition to its antihistamine effect, so it, it will give you, it will handle the acid situation if you really have an acid problem, but not like the proton pump inhibitors will basically kill off all acid production. And in addition, famotidine is unique among all the drugs for used for antiacid that it also uh, drastically either decreases the production of serotonin or actually blocks of serotonin at the receptors. With And with these two effects, antihistamine and antiserotonin, that's one of the best things you can do for your digestion. Yeah. Wow. I, I know that there was something between like the first generation and the second generation antihistamines and things like Benadryl, ciproheptidine actually being way more safe and effective than yes. the later drugs that came out. So I know you have the ciproheptidine at Idea Labs. And when I was going through a lot of the mold, exposure and kind of trying to get my histamine serotonin all of this under wraps um i did find that ciproheptidine was pretty useful with the elevated serotonin levels benadryl works just as yeah. well um it's one of the like basically the uh, ciproheptidine is a member of the so-called uh, family of drugs called tricyclics one of the first antidepressants to this day very safe drugs uh, but of course pharma has the ssris and another reason is that they found that the old tricyclic so-called of which ciproheptidine is a member they're serotonin blockers. So pharma really doesn't want to draw the parallel between the first generation of drugs that treated depression by being anti-serotonin <laughs> and now the new drugs that are being sold for depression that are actually marketed as pro-serotonin. Um, th- nobody wants to ask that question because somebody will say, well, hold on. They can both be right, right? <laughs> Which one of these works, <laughs> right? They have the exactly 180 degree opposite effect. So the ultracyclics are good um, for v- many conditions, and they're also known to block endotoxin at the receptor level, specifically drugs like Benadryl. Uh, they directly block the TLR4 receptor. So if you have a problem with digestion, a lot of flushing, a lot of gas, bloating, etc., sometimes taking just a little bit of Benadryl, cyproheptadine, or some of the other tricyclics such as nortriptyline, uh, can actually really help will help you get out of a, of a of a bad place. Yeah, so I think it's important to distinguish. We're not saying like we're just going to take Benadryl or ciproheptidine forever as a Band-Aid. It's yeah. more so, or actually it is a Band-Aid approach that we're, we're talking about because as we work behind the scenes on our diet, our lifestyle, our environmental ex- exposures and all these different things to bring the metabolic rate up, if we help the body by breaking some of these cycles, by using antihistamine, for example, then the body can maybe get out of this negative spiral a little bit quicker. And so that's yes. where we see these different what are maybe considered drugs having an actual very real and important role in improving our health. And so 
well, they're over the counter. So yeah, exactly. You know, they've been sold for, for, over the counter for a while now. So uh, as chain breakers, I think it's it's good to keep it in mind as a chain breaker. Yeah, that's not great. as something that will allow you to guzzle poofa, but then of course I'm taking my saproheptin, so everything's going to be fine. That's not the approach that that, uh, that I think we're advocating. It's more like I'm in a really bad spot. I need I need an out, an air way out. So that drug can help me get a way out. And then I need to, then by, you know, restoring some of my sanity and my energy, I can think about what happened, what got me into the situation. I can prevent it from happening again. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think too, maybe this could help, you know, your sleep. And so as different segments of your life start to improve, you can think more clearly, function better, and everything just starts to move uphill. So it is a, it's a long journey. And I feel like, you know, I'm finally just getting out of just one environmental toxin that kind of knocked me off my feet, which was really Mm. difficult to overcome. And so it can be very discouraging. So having these tools in your toolbox is encouraging to know that, you know, it's not you. And here's some things you can do in the meantime, as you work to bring your metabolic rate up. And I think, yeah, the way, the way I look at them is they're basically, all of them are are preventing or helping to break out of so-called learned helplessness. In many cases, really the, the people getting in a bad spot is because they're saying, Nothing works. I'm screwed, right? So I'm just going to let go and, I don't know, drink or something and then basically wait for the inevitable. Uh, but uh, animal studies have shown that when you actually stress the rats and, and, and put them into so-called inescapable stress, all of them develop or help us this and give up and die. If you put them in a, a bucket of water, they don't swim. They actually allow themselves to drown. But if they see another rat being capable of, ex- of escaping, then they get motivated. They don't get into learned helplessness and they swim. And sometimes they chew through the bucket and manage to get out. Uh, so really, that's so getting out of the learned helplessness in our situation would be either hang out with people that have been through a lot mm-hmm. or manage to get out of it and kind of give you this vibe so you can, you know, you know, uh, take off on some of it uh, or have these tools in your toolbox or you're in a really bad spot. You think you're basically in a, you know, in a bad metabolic learned help situation. You can snap out of it. Right. And then say, OK, what happened? Why did they get here? What can I do to not get here again? And, and you know, and that's pretty much it. So tool to for the really rainy days, not something that, you know, if, if every day is rainy, then that's a discussion you have with yourself of what's going on and why your life is in the situation. Yes. More often, virtually every single time, it's not you. It's just a combination of family and factors that can, you know, sometimes can be hard to deal with. But you cannot deal with that until you snap out of the Lord helplessness. Mm-hmm. Yes. I think that's so important too. Um, and a lot of reason that we wanted to do a podcast and talk to people like you because I personally know what it's like to feel hopeless and helpless. And so being able to share these tools that have helped me and move me forward in my journey and hear these stories and all these incredibly useful resources that you talk about maybe can help somebody else escape yeah. that learned helplessness and start that often very difficult uphill battle but at the top i think it's definitely worth it to get there yep. to climb out of that nothing water is unfixable nothing yeah. is unfixable your body was not designed to turn on itself oh, yeah. so if something is going on it can be fixed and there's a usual external reason for that and you know getting out of the work helps just will allow you to identify that reason or reasons and, and and actually have the energy to deal with them gosh can you imagine being Sorry. born like 150 or 200 years ago in like a completely different environment and completely different lifestyle different food we didn't have these health issues <laughs> yeah i agree look at the look at the pictures from the early 20s these tall men and women going to uh, uh ballroom galas and whatnot um and now basically uh if you look at the average height which is one of the best indicators of overall health it's been steadily declining over the last 50 years look at the iq tests uh steadily declining over the last 30 to 40 years it used to be rising so they call it the Flynn effect. The Flynn effect is F L Y N N. If you type it in Google, it will show you. It was very well established that after the basically the first two thirds of the 20th century, people were apparently doing better. Things were going well with the world. Whatever happened in the 70s, after that, it's, it has been down. I think it's correlated to everything we've talked about today because this connected to that. I remember Ray was saying that women who had adequate progesterone and thyroid levels throughout their pregnancy, their children came out with higher IQ levels. Smart. Very smart. Yeah, yeah exactly. And so, yeah. obviously, there's there's something going on there. Less progesterone produced, more estrogenic chemicals in the environment, toxic drugs while you're pregnant. Uh, first of all, very strong social pressure against getting pregnant. Now, if you if you're in the city and if you're pregnant, most people give it a give it a dirty eye. It's like uh, we have an overpopulation problem. Why the hell are you pregnant? Like, why do you want to? They call you a breeder. That's like a, yeah, the, a term, you know, an insulting term. So it's really it's not an easy situation now to have a child, right? 
and you know your body is, in, is not in a good situation, your environment is not in a good situation, you have a child and you want to give it the best you can, but it's actually starting off, unfortunately, for many people worse yeah. than, than, than what you had. It's scary. I think we should do a future podcast and like, you know, maybe ways we can set ourselves up, both men and women, to be able to conceive and have a child that has a chance in this in this world. Because I think there's a lot of different things we could talk about with that topic too. Yeah, definitely. Male infertility is now surpassing female infertility. Yeah, that is used not to be all blamed on, used to be all blamed on the woman. Now they're saying, no, actually, not only is 50, used to be 50-50 up until a few years ago. Now it's like more like 65 to 35 in favor of the male, meaning the male is you know, much more likely to be infertile than the yeah. female. Get your shit together. I keep telling my boyfriend this, so um, we're going to have to have a conversation about this, and I'll have him listen. To- <laughs> okay, yes. so we've talked about a lot of depressing <laughs> things on today's podcast. Can we end on a good note? Georgie, share something that you are looking forward to this year that is going uh, to either provide happiness or, like, yeah. help move your life forward. Are you going to run away? <laughs> Oh, I think, no, I'm not going to run away. I think it's, it's better to stay and fight, okay? This, this this whole running away probably would have worked 200 years ago. By now, the system is so pervasive everywhere that basically you have to carve out kind of like a niche for yourself, plant yourself firmly with your two feet and get ready to fight. Mm-hmm. And I think that, that that moment is coming. The good news is so many people have opened their eyes and have realized that the system is just, use the, doc, uh, the words of Dr. Pete, is systematically murdering them with, from many different directions. And now they're saying, I will not participate in the system. Uh, if you look at the, the charts, both men and women are dropping out of the colleges. They're not going to the, at least uh, the disciplines that are completely useless to your, to, your, to, your daily, to your daily life. People are no longer going to finance. People are no longer going to economics. Uh, you know, they're actually moving towards learning practical skills like homesteading, you know, how to start a family, how to maintain a family, both men and women. I don't, I'm not a very, I'm not a tradition that says like women should be in the house and men should be out in the field. It's actually, back in the day, if you look how it worked, and I know because I grew up in a village, spent my summers in a village in Bulgaria, everybody worked hard, and I did not see any difference between men and women in the terms of, in terms of like, uh, how much work each was doing. This whole thing of like women, men putting their feet on the on the table and like the women cleaning in the kitchen, that's a myth. May have happened in the cities actually. I've seen it in the cities, but ne- never in the countryside. Over there, you're one with nature and you either contribute or you'd perish. There's just no, there's no third way. <laughs> so the good thing is, I think is many people have woken up. They've started to take things into their own, into their own hands. People are now dropping out of the medical system, specifically the treatment of chronic disease. They're starting to go into these family physicians, which used to be probably the most respected profession mm-hmm. uh, up until, let's say, 50 years ago. Your family doctor is somebody your family grew up with. Uh, this person knew all of your problems. It, both family, right, <laughs> and social and physical and financial and whatnot. So this person was really part of your life, and this is person you can confide to. Like you didn't, you weren't worried. You weren't worried that this person is going to somehow take advantage of the information that you're giving. There were no medical records that this person can actually now mine, data mine for information and sell you more drugs. Now they are, but if you go into the city, especially these massive health uh, organizations, that's what they're doing. So good news is people understand that the system is not healthy for them. And they're kind of dropping out in droves. Um, and they're forming their own little enclaves that are more or less resistant to what the system has to offer. Because once you understand that the, 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 what modernity really has to offer uh, used to be very little. I think now it's actually on a net basis. You're actually giving a lot without getting anything in return. Yeah. Uh, and I think people have already woken up to that fact. Uh, just uh, And if you look at the, the, the labor participation rate, has been dropping for a very long time. And now is it the lowest it has ever been. That's different from the unemployment rate, which can be manipulated in a different way. I mean, the government agencies have this different way of counting unemployment. But it cannot manipulate the labor participation rate, which is basically how many of the work-capable people are actually working uh, in positions that report to the government. That rate is at the lowest it has ever been, which means people are checking out and starting to worry about themselves and their family and their community and not contributing anymore to this pathological system. Oh, interesting. So what, how does that apply to you? What are you, where are your feet at? Basically, I mean, self-sufficient. Uh, if you have a small business, that's great. Um, you know, if you can thrive in the city, that's fine. But I think at some point, it's unavoidable that I'll have to probably either move out of the city or at least go to the suburbs. Because the situation here in the inner cities, I think, is going to get nastier. But we want to finish on a higher note, right? Uh, you know, start your own business if you can. Or work with like-minded people that have their own business. Somebody has a farm. You can probably contribute to working on the farm. Um, make sure that the food production 
and access to these very very basic, I don't want to call them drugs, but metabolic modulators, such as aspirin, vitamin E, progesterone, etc., is in your own hands, or at least very, very easy to control. You can go to like a local compounding pharmacy, where you know the pharmacist, or you have some access to somebody who has these things on hand. So that's really the things you should be looking for. Most of the things that are really advanced, quote unquote, that medicine has to offer, they have shown now to have zero benefit for your health. Recent study about colonoscopies, perhaps the most uh, promoted procedure ever, medical procedure, for preventing cancer and the death from cancer, specifically colon cancer. Now they found out that it basically has no effect, zero effect on your mortality from cancer. And in fact, it has very low effect on diagnosing cancer at earlier stages. And to make matters even worse, aspirin, taking a daily aspirin, was shown to completely replace any benefit, imaginary or real, that the colonoscopy would have without the side effects of the colonoscopy. So I think that's a great example of just how little the modern system has to offer you while taking quite a bit in return from your finances, your time, right, your health. Yeah, most of these things are already in your control. There's no need to give them to somebody else. Yeah, well, on the topic of small business then, where can people find you? Uh, the blog is probably the best way to read about uh, the the because uh, I often comment on scientific studies. The blog is hey dude h a i d is in dog u t is in tom hey dude dot me m e. That's the blog. It feeds into the Twitter my Twitter account, which is twitter dot com slash hey dude, and I have a company called Idea Labs, and we sell these many of these uh, substances that we that we discussed today, and we're now starting to do some you know research with animals uh, to see basically the, to prove that some of these things can hopefully uh, take care of some really nasty conditions. Of course, we'll, we'll only be able to claim that this happens in animals, but people can make their own conclusions. Um, and that's pretty much it. I mean, basically, uh, that's my company, my little boutique company. I would rather have a farm, but I'm in the city, so that's my. That, those are my little piggies here. I, yeah, I'm, a, I, I'm an excited supporter of Idea Labs. I love Thank you, you know a lot of the different supplements, just so everybody knows they do have different thyroid options there. They have all the fat soluble vitamins, progesterone, vitamin E, things that, you know, are actually pretty difficult to find uh, available in a form without all these different additives that we were talking about earlier. So very valuable resources, Idea Labs. And one more thing, you guys are working on nail test and a hair test. And this is important because a lot of people think that they have a low estrogen problem because their blood levels of estrogen are low, but that's actually not a great predictor of your total body it's estrogen. True. Can you yeah, talk a little yeah. bit about <laughs> what you guys are doing at Idea Labs yeah. and how someone can actually get a test to show, wait, 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 my tissue estrogen levels are off the charts. Yeah. So Dr. Peter has been saying for years that menopause is not a condition of low estrogen uh, because the, the blood tests do not measure because when it, when it, the way you diagnose with menopause is they'll give you these blood tests. And I think if, if three months in a row, your 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 uh, blood levels of estradiol, which is the main estrogen and progesterone, are undetectable. They will tell you, well, your ovaries have failed, and basically you're menopausal now. And that is true, actually. If you're most of the estradiol and the progesterone in the blood are coming from the from the ovaries. However, those are not the only tissues that can produce these hormones. Uh, and uh, even though progesterone is mostly produced in the female ovaries, estrogen in both males and females can be produced by any cell. So it's a really nasty molecule. Without the sort, the main source of estrogen, which is usually the gonads, the testicles for men and the ovaries for women, your body can still produce a ton of estrogen. It's just not detectable in the bloodstream because it stays in the cell. Um, and then uh, Dr. P has been saying that, look, the tissue estrogen is high. You guys haven't looked at it. If you look at it, you'll see it in menopause women. It's actually very high because the symptoms that we're getting in menopause, such as edema, uh, easily fatigued, uh, breast cancer, uh, the most popular kind of which is estrogen receptor positive. How can you have an estrogen driven disease if you're deficient in estrogen? All of these things that uh, Big Pharma has kind of said like, well, this is all peripheral. There's no direct smoking gun. Uh, but uh, a Chinese team recently published a, a study by analyzing the over, I think, 30 different uh, steroids in hair samples of over 300 women and demonstrated with aging, estrogen not only does not decline, but it rises. And since your hair is composed of dead cells, that means that your cells basically are definitely not getting estrogen deficient as you're aging. In fact, they're accumulating more estrogen. What does decline with aging, according to that study, progesterone declined, T3 declined, the active thyroid hormone, DHEA declined, which is known also in blood tests to decline, uh, and also known 
uh, causative factor in many diseases, pregnenolone decline, progesterone decline. So all of these things that are, we know that are good for health are showing decline in the actual inside of the cell where they matter because you are a collection of cells, right? Mm -hmm. Everything else is extra, extracellular fluid that it serves for distributing of either nutrients or hormones or other chemical signals. So really the blood testing is just telling you two things. Number one, it basically like uh, you know what's the whether, whether the transport mechanism is working well, right? Or two, and two, the organs that are producing some of these specific mediators, in this case the ovaries, because they're the primary source of estradiol or progesterone, whether they're working well. Well, we know that the ovaries are failing in menopause, but it does not mean that your estrogen levels fall. And this study demonstrated it. So we started doing our own analysis of these steroids and many others. Now we also started to, to analyze histamine, serotonin, and dopamine uh, in hair and nail. Some fascinating correlations there too as well. Uh, as well as the minerals. Uh, you know, there may be 12 to 15 minerals that are participating in enzymatic reactions inside of your body. Magnesium, sodium, potassium, calcium, uh, sulfur, um, uh, you know, uh, zinc, selenium. These are, you know, all of these minerals are very important for your health. So we're testing for those because it shows tissue levels, right? That's where they matter. There are blood tests that exist for those, but just as the tissue levels and the, the example with the estrogen and progesterone, just because you have certain levels in the blood does not correlate necessarily to what's going on in the tissue. And this is especially true about the heavy metals, which we're also testing for, which are universally toxic. Uh, I cannot count how many times people have come to us with a health problem and said, something is not right. The doctor cannot find out what, you know, what's, what's going on. All my tests, the blood tests look normal. And we'll do a heavy metal analysis, and it turns out the person is very, he very heavy, very high on lead, or cadmium, uh, or titanium. You know, and uh, when we see titanium, they say, "Well, what's going on? Titanium? I don't wear any jewelry. Where's titanium coming from?" And then I look at the drugs that they're taking, and guess what? Titanium mm -hmm. dioxide in every single one of them. Mm -hmm. And titanium, as I mentioned earlier, in very, very tiny doses, is capable of causing diabetes. So it's really nothing to laugh at. So we're doing the analysis of minerals and steroids currently available already in both hair and nails. Um, and they both work equally well, but I think people start to prefer hair because with hair, you can actually test a longer time period. Each half an inch of hair measured from the scalp going out represents about a month in the past. So if you what basically... Is this, if you six, what is all this? That's, oh, that's years. That's years. <laughs> years the, but that's good. If you want to know, actually, if you want to test like what happened over the last two years, you can take a, a strand of hair. It doesn't have to be thick, but very long, right? You cut it. And then you cut it into pieces of, let's say, an inch each. And we can do the analysis if you want. We'll do it for free. And then basically we can tell you what happened over the last year or two years. Uh, and actually specific periods, each one of which is about a month in length. So you can say, oh, my dogs ran away because I remember it happened. Yeah, two and years look, ago. Look at, look at what happened in cortisol. Cortisol is through the roof here, right? Or I don't know, something else. Oh, the, the feed with the chicken feed stuff. USDA and FDA getting on my nerves. Look at cortisol. It's spiking again. So that's, that kind of stuff, we can show things that are not visible in the blood. And the, more importantly, I think, is that because we're covering the long term, that's what actually matters. So when you go to a doctor and get a blood test, you're getting basically your state right there in them. And steroid levels can change like in a matter of minutes or even seconds. Some people are afraid of the doctor. They'll present with a higher cortisol there, right? Mm -hmm. The doctor will measure and say, oh, my God, I have a cortisol problem. But when people at home, they're fine. Other people, basically, maybe something happened. They're calm at the doctor, but they actually do have a cortisol problem. And what matters is your chronic exposure to these inflammatory substances, not just how quick every once in a while you get acutely exposed to them. That's fine. That's what they were designed for, right? When you're under stress to handle the stress. But when we take a, a, a you know, this strand of hair that represents an entire month continuously, and then let's say the average levels there of cortisol are higher than what they should be, chances are that during that month, you are not in very good health. Um, and, you know, just by looking at this in the past and very recently up to like, we can look at the last 48 hours. If you tie, cut a very, very uh, tiny piece of hair very close to the scalp, within 48 hours, we can actually uh, sh show changes in the last 48 wow. hours. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. We're definitely going to have to do some of that testing. So we will follow up. Let me know. Just yeah. send me hair and let me know what you want tested and then uh, we'll do the testing. <laughs> cool. We cool. can do minerals and steroids. Yeah, so that's available through Idea Labs. Yes, on the, on the website. We'll okay. include yeah. all of those links in the show yeah. notes. And just as a note Thank to you. people, Idea Labs is a little, your website, I love it, but you have to go to another website to read about the product. Well, I have a solution for that. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, for the so for the reading through the product, that's that's for liability reasons. The website only sells the products, 
but the links to the, on the website go, take you to a forum. That's right? genius. And then over there you have studies and yes. comments from other people and whatnot. Yeah. FDA kind of says that you don't want to put too many things that claim something about the product on your own website yes. because you're claiming it and that can be, create a problem. You're claiming effectiveness, you're claiming you know safety or lack of safety and whatnot. You're not allowed to do that. But if other people are saying, then I don't control them. They're free to speak their mind. FDA yeah, can't and, take you down. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. It's very useful yeah. because you actually can't really tell them precisely how to utilize the product either. So therefore, you can read other people's experiences and precisely. so on. Which and I don't control. Forth. Full disclaimer: yeah. I don't own that forum. I don't participate in management. <laughs> I'm a regular user, so I put it there. And there, so far, honest to God, I have not asked anybody because I cannot do it myself. Yeah. I have not asked anybody to take down a negative review or whatnot. There are people there that are saying certain things didn't work for them. Yeah. There are people saying we're great for them. So go there and read it. And that's that. But as far as, because we have a, like two pages, one with cosmetics and one with the lab chemicals, instead of going to two separate pages, then we have a, the actual shopping cart has its own separate URL address where you go, the you, you can see the blood tests, you can see the cosmetics, and you can see the lab chemicals all on the same site. And it's Idea Labs, the name of the company, and then dot. E C Y E uh, E C W I D um, dot com. E-C- so that's basically the actual shopping cart. The main website uses it, but it's got pictures and other things, right? And uh, the two separate pages. If people don't want to look through two separate pages, then they can go directly to the shopping cart and for buying. For the information, they go to the website and click on the link. Yes, and you'll respond to emails pretty quickly, so you'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If, there, if there's any question, yes. let me know. You know, I, I, I do my best to respond. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm staring at this email 24 seven. So, all right. <laughs> Chances are you'll get a quick. We're gonna get a quick response from you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Georgie. I, I feel like our next conversation will be related, maybe about the estrogen, progesterone, and all the different things we were talking about. So, yep. Yeah. Cool. Yep, I think it's a very important. Topic. Fertility is very, very uh, painful topic these days. Do you know that, that one in three couples cannot beget naturally now these days? I believe that. I do. One in three. That is not one okay. One in three. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm climbing my own uphill battle even in this world for two to three years. It's still challenging to overcome how you treated your body the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. So it is not a topic to take lightly. You go to any major city, Turn on the radio, chances are within the next 10 minutes you're going to hear a commercial about a fertility center. Yeah. Uh, oh. And I remember, because I've been in D.C. for 20-some years, they, these commercials were not there, let's say, like 10 years ago. They started happening about eight years ago, and over the last five years, really intensified. And I check because I read these medical studies, and they say, one in three couples, if you let them just be on their own, right, they cannot naturally conceive. What? Usually now because of the male. Um, <sighs> and then, you know, uh, even and now even with help, the help actually is not that effective. So medicine is like you're already infertile and you go to the doctor and they're like, eh, you know, we can do in vitro because given your parameters, whether male or female, it's whichever is responsible, um, we don't think anything other than in vitro would work. Of course, most institutions don't cover in vitro. You have to pay out of pocket. Doctors love it. And, I, and I'm thinking that's not something to be celebrated. You know, like I don't think it's a good idea to, to have these commercials about fertility centers on the radio. First, because it indicates how bad the situation is. And two, because your people are not helping. In vitro success rate is like in the lower single percentage digits. Oh, yeah. yeah. One of our friends just went through it. And I mean, she was some gross amount of money spent and then it didn't work. And then she conceived naturally. So it was like. There you go. Oh, yeah. When I said find a person you're in love with and run into the woods, I'm not just saying this out of romantic reasons because I'm a, you know, a, a real romantic at heart. It's because I know couples who went through hell for fertility treatment. They pumped the woman full of clomiphene to stimulate the production, right? They gave the man, I don't know what they gave the man. Uh, and then they tried and tried for years, got themselves into learn helplessness, and eventually said, you know what? Screw it. We spent all this money. Now we're broke. We got nothing to show for it. The doctor now says, oh, maybe you have cancer. I'm not going to send you to an oncologist. Enough of this. Then they go on a nice vacation for two weeks, come back pregnant. Ah, so, uh, <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. Yes. Four couples that I know that are like that. They went through. They had provable, intreatable infertility. Actually, they, when it's untreatable, they call it sterility whether male or female. Um, And usually, more often than not, the regimen was work your ass off. Sorry to use that word. Work your (laughs) butt off. Work out like a madman, like a maniac or a mad woman. Uh, Go to work for 12 hours, right? Eat all of these restrictive diets. Of course, take your clomiphene, take your other, whatever, give the male. And you wonder why it doesn't work. Well, creating a baby only works in this world when your body thinks you're in a very good situation 
and you can spare some extra resources to create to create new life. If you don't have these resources to maintain your own life, of course the body is going to turn off that function and say you can't afford it right now. I'm sorry, you know. Only only babies are the joy of life. They only come when your life is joyful. Oh, I love that. Well, yeah. that's a preview of our next conversation and how this <laughs> negative cycle impacts your fertility level. Yes. Yeah, awesome. that'll be Great fun. topic. Thank you so much, All right, Georgie. Thank you, Georgie.